welcome back to Rings and Realms Retrospective. Today, we're going to be talking about the Numenor story with Alan Sisto and Kirsten Cairns. And so that's when I punched Cameron. Welcome. Mm. We are going to talk about Numenor today. And Maggie and I today are joined by Kirsten Cairns and Alan Sisto. So we are excited to dig into Numenor and talk about some of the stuff we didn't get to talk about. So, Corey, why don't you start us off by contextualizing a little bit where we are right now and right. some of the things that we're looking at going into season three. So, yeah, again, like big picture, the kind of trajectory, right? We begin with... So we ended with a return home. Um, I thought that one of the uh, one of the most successful endings of season one was the Numenor one. Yeah. The, the you know pulling into the harbor with the black drapes and the you know the signs of mourning. Um, the way the the ominousness, the portentousness of that, mm. and then of course with the added freight. Uh, for Tolkien fans of knowing yeah. like the usurpation of our Farazan is nigh, right? Yeah. Like, it, and you know, so the anticipation, it was great. Um, so I really loved how that kind of led into things. Mm -hmm. The, uh, you know, we, we went from the coronation of Mirio right through to, you know, the Eagle sequence and the usurpation officially by Farazan, and then the shift focusing to Mirio and Elendil, yes. and the establishment of the faithful, yeah. and the beginning of the the persecution of the faithful by the king's men, and the emergence of the king's men, um, through the trial by Abyss, mm -hmm. and the sea worm issue, um, all the way through to the, the final persecution in yeah. the last. So that's our, you know, thinking of the overall shape mm -hmm. of that, and where, um, where the focus is. The establishment, the relationship between the old and the new in Numenor um, is interesting. What I find, one of the things that I find most interesting and kind of complicated about it is the way in which, on the one hand, there's this clear sense of, um, you know, the, the way of the faithful is the old ways, like those who, 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 who adhere to the old ways. And we think back to season one, there's, you know, the, the traditional you know, allegiance or, mm -hmm. you know, alliance at least between Numenor and elves. Yeah. Um, and, but although that's old, there's also the sense that it's so old, nobody really remembers yeah. it. You know, even Tar Palantir being like, we should be, you know, connected with the elves again. Yeah. It's not like everyone's like, no, we don't want to do that. Everyone's like, what? Yeah. You know, like Who? it's not relevant right. to anyone's right. lives anymore. Um, and so there's a sense, at least I got the sense in season one, that Tar Palantir's revival, like there were there may there were people presumably receptive mm -hmm. to that, but not because they were already like, we've always loved elves. No. And mm -hmm. we're glad to have a king who sympathizes with of our point not. of view. And, and that right. fits with the timeline because right. by the time Tar Palantir becomes king in Numenor, right. the king's men is far and away the larger more powerful faction the faithful are persecuted yeah uh, they are you know, it, it, it's definitely a bad situation for the faithful they are a minority and uh so it definitely fits in that regard and so and we see that um you know i, I was i was joking the the scene with um elendil's trial yes right and the 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 crowd scenes there mm -hmm. you know it's like the gallop pole of numenor yes. right, like, right. what is the sentiment of the numenorean crowd now you know because we can see the majority king's men, and then we see the like uncomfortable faithful, <laughs> yes. you know, yeah. uh, who are it's, and so yeah, that, that, it does a good job of showing both the numerical kind mm -hmm. of balance right mm -hmm. between the king's men and the faithful, but also the like the different attitudes, yeah, right. Uh, you know, the the faithful are not a, a vocal minority. You know, they weren't no. a rowdy minority. They no. were a very self conscious mm -hmm. minority, right? Um, for good reason. Yeah, for yeah. good reason. And one of the things that I think, though, well, yes, for good reason, but at the same time, the goodness of that reason had not been established quite in the show. Not in the show. That's in the correct. show, right? Yeah. And yeah. and I don't. It seems to me that the show is inviting us to think of the king's men as a new phenomenon, mm -hmm. right? It re again, it really is more about, in the in the time frame 
that the book has given, the way that the, the movements of the Numenorean story, when Numenorean history, you know, when thousands of years in, of Numenorean history are, are, are summarized, mm -hmm. right? We get this shift over time um, towards, uh, it, it's, a, it's a more, um, I was going to say like unidirectional, but that's not quite the right word. Um, anyway, it's, it's it a does trend one direction. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. I mean, because they're all faithful at first. Right. You know, right. for a very long time, they're all faithful. And it's only after the, the kings start to, to have that, that hunger, that yearning that becomes, yes. you know, a, a, a jealousy and then a, an outspoken bitterness. Only then do we start to see the rise of the king's men. Yes. And that's and it's sort of like that's how you define a faction. I mean, the faithful are only the faithful because there's a king's men. Right. If there were no king's right. men, you wouldn't have to call anybody faithful because they'd all be that. But right. I think there's a little bit of a, for me, there's a little bit of a dichotomy between uh, season one and season two. Because as you both just pointed out, in season one, uh, there's like, it doesn't seem like they're a faithful at all. We're not really aware of them. Um, right. It seems like Elendil might be the only one. It seems like... Tar Palantir is like a yeah. faction of one. Right, right, yeah. right. Because yeah. yeah. even Elendil uh, uh, yeah. is He's not. hiding it, yeah. right? He's at least... And, yeah, yeah and, yeah. and it seems like Anarion might be away because of his beliefs, etc. And even uh, there, they're like reluctant to talk about right, it. Right, it's yeah. kind yeah. of there, a... I mean, there's this very much... We don't much mention like, your We don't brother. mention Anarion right. vibe, right? Yeah, right? yeah. Anarion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're trying to sing because I lost my mind. But but in season two... By contrast, I know they're still the minority, but we start seeing them a lot more. Yeah. Like now suddenly there's a temple where they regularly worship. And, and it's not a secret hidden temple because no. the Kingsmen know exactly where it is and they know when they're going to be there. And, the, you know, and yeah. so it's like, oh, were the faithful that present? And we use the word faithful a lot more. Yeah. You know, yeah. like they right. actually call it as they say right. it. And it then, and then they yeah. get called yeah. into the court. Right. Uh, in is it episode eight, yeah. like it's uh, why have you summoned us here? Is the, and I'm like, also oh, is there a, like a whole you know bishops and right. priests Hierarchy. and of the faithful here? So it's a little odd to me that the, they were almost invisible in season one, and then in order to persecute them in season two, we have to make them visible so yeah. they can be persecuted. That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of. I'm thinking back to season one. Right, I'm I'm kind of trying to think through, like, think backwards through that pattern, and one of the things that was most noticeable in season one was Muriel and, and Elendil and their own relationship mm -hmm. to yeah. faithfulness, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, by which I don't mean the virtue, but mm -hmm. affiliation with being considered one of the faithful. Um, and it's interesting because in that conversation they have that first quite intimate conversation in the boat, right? In the hold of the boat when she's practicing walking blind, yeah. right? Um, and he suggests that it was she who, like, reignited his faithfulness, right? That right. he... So, so we remember the scene. This kind of begins with the scene with Muriel and Elendil when she gives him the sword, right? The, like, you're... Galadriel's babysitter now sword, right? right? That, that that he receives, which becomes like the captaincy of their of their expedition, right? Um, and that's the the scene where she asks him about his name. What does your name mean? And he gives a very cautious, ta tactful reply, right? Mm -hmm. Right, one who loves the stars, right? Which is not wrong, yeah. right? But um, it's and she probes is 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 that all is that, that it means? What I think it means, right? Yeah. And he's like. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> right. I mean, both of them are feeling each other out so mm -hmm. carefully, and you yeah. get the impression it's there's already stigma attached. Yeah. Yeah. To Even if there's not open persecution, yes. there is at least yeah. stigma. Yeah. I think that's a way, a good way of putting it. And it's understandable for Muriel, right? It's yeah. understandable for Muriel because of her dad. Yep. Right. Right. Like, look where that got him. Right. Uh, and she has a mind to her own future political career, right? I don't want to end up like, I would quite like to be queen and not. Queen stuck in the tower, like dad is king stuck in the tower, right? right? Like let's 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 not do that. So in order to do that, I'm gonna, you know, the way we see her acting one way in front of Farazan and the whole court, mm -hmm. and then acting slightly differently with Elendil when she's still being cautious, and then acting quite differently with Galadriel when yeah. Galadriel goes up the tower and she shows her, and she shows her the palantir. Um, so it's clear that Muriel genuinely shares the convictions of her father mm -hmm. but equally clear 
that she does not feel politically at liberty to. Well, right. and, and she also, she didn't Come out of the seem yeah. keen on Galadriel. No. So there was that no. as well, that yes, she seems to share a lot of her father's <laughs> thoughts, but when Galadriel came there, she was like, you know, mm -hmm. what are you doing here? Elf. Right. There was yeah. a clear right. kind of uh, animosity there. Right. That part of it felt like a performance. Political gamesmanship. But when yeah. she's talking to Galadriel privately, like not in front of the whole crowd, mm. And she's still mean to her. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I felt that that was quite yeah. both genuine. From yeah, her, quite I agree. I agree. And, and that's sort of like, I can be one of the faithful and approve of the idea of Numenor being connected with the elves and still think you're a jerk. Yeah. 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 Right? Still not <laughs> trust you. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Or also have this element of like, you're making my life harder, right? Yeah. Because she's oh, yeah. like, I can't hide it as easily if you're right there in right. front of me. So She does not have the I also took that as yet. Yeah, yes. I took it as an inconvenience. Well, well, and she has that fear of what she has seen mm -hmm. uh, in the yes. Palantir and, yes. and yeah. what she fears that something, some is disaster coming. is going to befall Numenor and anything that seriously rocks the boat, if uh, I may use oh. that. <laughs> God, we're so punny. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, is not what she wants. So, you know, it's like the, the, the smalling of full stones kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. that she's like, well, this character showing up here right now, a high elf rocking up here, something that hasn't happened. We, we've just been talking about the faithful have kind of gone right underground. We've had no contact for centuries. And now this, is this the start of the avalanche? Is this the yes. beginning? And right. so maybe part of her animosity is just a fear of anything yeah. which might be the catalyst which begins the disaster that sure. she fears. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so I think I just figured it out. This right is a bad right sign, now. by the way. Yeah, <laughs> right. That just like now. I all this thinking, this all this talking, and you're only now right. figuring something out. But I out. think I figured it right. out. I think I figured out what we're supposed to take for like why the faithful, like, are in the closet in season one, and now we have like a high priest of the faithful. Right. I think we're supposed to understand that's Muriel's fault. Muriel is out of the closet when she comes back. Mm -hmm. She, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. she holds the king's yeah. funeral at the shrine of the faithful. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Such that it okay. brings okay. Faraz on himself to the old quarter where right. he's slumming, you know, with Philandil and right. and the and the other folks. Um, but so I think that when she comes back, the decision that she seems to make, like the whole like, are you going to wear red or white at your coronation? Oh yeah, yeah. That. white. Whites. Thank you. Yep. Right. Yeah. Like the that whole conversation. She is basically saying, like, I'm I am, sticking to my guns. Here. I'm sticking to my yeah. guns. I am yeah. going to be. I am. I am faithful and proud. Yeah. Yes. And that I. I. So my new theory that I just thought of is that we're supposed to see that that's what creates the shift in culture. If that is the case, okay. Once again, as I said in a previous chat, is that a cutting room floor victim? Yeah, right? I wonder. Because that's a lot to ask us. Yeah, to be like, oh, this is happening because. And it wouldn't yeah. have taken much no. for that to make sense. So you could see that that would be a scene of like, oh, does it really matter? I'm not sure. And here we are saying, oh, yeah, that was important. Right. You probably should have kept that. The yeah, thing very I very quick, ten yeah. second, twenty yeah. second right. conversation with Elendil. Yeah. Though the thing I always feel like I have to say to be fair is that how many times have we said all they needed to do is add just one I little know, scene and when we add them up there's no room like you know yeah. I, I, their response might well, well be yeah is this where I give you the like, answer to where they could have found room yeah <laughs> Oh, this is also a running joke throughout these uh, No, <laughs> no. We've had I think that conversation, has, Alan. You missed the boat yeah, on that. Oh, we have opinions on that. that. Yes. But we have also had so conversations. So I was kicked off the boat on that. You were kicked off the boat But we have also had conversations about series length. Like, yeah. Yeah. eight is an arbitrary number. Eight is. Ten yes. might have worked better. Twelve would be great. Four yes. is a possibility that we none of us are fans of. So, yes. uh, you know, eight's never going to be enough. Ten's never going to be enough. There will always be things that we wish were in there. Mm -hmm. But you do kind of wonder, what was that discussion between eight and ten? Is I, I feel like there is a little bit more of a tradition of 10 yeah. now. So yeah. adding that little bit more, you might have to see the Harfoots in the stores a little bit more. But we would also would have, that we would have gotten more, more of other things. Yeah. 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 Well, though, this is another one of the, I mean, again, I'm, 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 I'm awaiting James' final numbers on these things. But yeah. um, the, Digital the prioritization, project. the prioritization yeah. of, I mean, the cost of the glorious development of the Celebrimbor storyline is the yeah. reduction yeah. Yeah. of the yeah. others. Yeah, and, and 
my one complaint really about Numenor in this season is I didn't get enough of it. No. I wanted and more Numenor. And we've said that a lot, you know, and, and it yeah. is at the cost of other storylines that we don't and have a lot of Numenor. I yeah. can't wait to see, because I think Tristan Gravel is fantastic. Yep. I cannot wait to see the head-to-head between him and Charlie Vickers. Oh, oh man. Like oh, we that's going to be good. Charlie, right? I love yeah. it. And so I'm very yeah. excited for what's coming there. Um, but I would have just liked more of that... I kn- again, difficult choices, I get it. But particularly yeah. Farazon, I felt like we really didn't hear from him enough this season. They I did a good job with the limited time they had. They sure I really did. That scene yeah. uh, in, in episode three, I believe it was, where he's speaking with his son, and, yes. and we get the whole explanation uh, in, in like two minutes of yeah. why there's a problem yeah. of this concern about mortality. Yes. Uh, they finally addressed that because last season it was just all about elves taking our jobs. I mean, it was it was nationalism and, and it was populism. It wasn't an issue about mortality versus serial longevity. Well, but I- interestingly, uh, I was having a chat with Tristan Gravel recently about the character and saying, what do you think is going on with him? Yeah. And, and yeah. one of his things was, though, that... Um, part of the reason that Farazon is particularly thinking about mortality now is because he's got as far as he can go he's as hit the glass mortal, ceiling. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when he was just sort of whatever his role was, Chancellor mm-hmm. to Midiel, he wanted more. Yeah. But if he's finally got to the point where he's more or less, by the end of the season at any rate, got absolute power in yeah. Numenor, is that it? Yeah. Where do I go next? And yeah. so maybe then he starts thinking about, well, if I finally got this, but I'm not as young as I was, I really want to be able to hang on to this. Yeah. Yeah. And so and so I can see that, um, yes, we didn't get that sense of the desire for the immortality, but I think maybe he didn't have it as much. I don't think that's, that's been in the back of his head from day one, you know? Yeah. And I also think we, ha- we also have to remember the way in which they are mapping the Numenor story Onto, they're playing it out within this generation with one single king, right? Yeah, we talked Which before about how he basically has to play the role of at least five different Numenorean kings. Yes, and the yeah. progression that we see over time is some. It's not that just that it has to be done sped up. You know, one of the things that I find funny: some people are like, you know, how in one generation are they going to get to like? you know, fear of mortality that makes him rebel. And I'm like, doesn't everybody get to the fear yeah, of right. mortality in <laughs> one generation? Like, that's, <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. we all get yeah. there, right? Like that's, you know, anyway, so it's, um, yes. But um, uh, I think that I was uh, saying, I think to James uh, yesterday, that if we have, if you were just to make a checklist, right? all the things that happen, like Numenorean elements, mm-hmm. elements of the Numenor story, and you make them into a checklist, mm-hmm. um, I, I believe they're all going to get checked off oh, yeah. by the yeah. end of the show. Yeah, we um, were already seeing hints for some of the ones that had been missing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Colonialism and um, expansion. And so, yes, they could. I, one thing that I think, and I don't know how exactly this particular expectation might have been managed differently, but... One problem I think that people have had is that they have tended to bring book fairs on expectations yeah. to the show, right? Like, well, this is what we know. Okay, so this is our fair. You know, we're 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 right at the end of Tar Palantir's reign, and right before our fairs on takes. The, in which case, this is this must be the situation in Numenor, right? The right. king's men must be developed to this point. The faithful are doing this. The they're they're. You know they've already been through this whole process of colonialization and 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 corruption and 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 fear of immor- of mortality and all that stuff. Um, so that's our starting point, right? And no, that's no. not our starting point, right? And that's and I think that's one of the reasons why the anti-elf stuff in season one hit people so strangely, mm. um, because it's not what they were expecting. They're like, I th- I thought I knew what. Yeah. Was going on? What should right. be going on at Numenor? And but I it think wasn't that. I think it was also because I mean I expected that they were because of the time compression. I expected them to to have Ferozon basically play the role of each of those different kings, going mm-hmm. from you know uh, what do, what do you mean we can't be immortal to okay we're going to go take some extra power in in Middle Earth and you know all of these things. Mm-hmm. And when the gripe with the elves was more about economics. Yeah. And and more about nationhood rather than about the jealousy. Like okay, if so it was just the underlying aspect of that. That that I think okay. was but that's just me. Okay. 
I'm gonna fight with you. Right. So yes. um, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and f- let me preface <laughs> let me preface this by saying, um, I am not in any way trying to maintain that the like the elves are gonna take our jobs scene wasn't awkward. It was. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm not trying to say, no, actually, that was a geniusly written scene. What I am saying is, I don't understand why everybody overlooks the fact that that is, they're showing the early stages of the concerns, the the jealousy of immortality. But the jealousy of immortality, okay, I mean, I... I That's why they don't, it's not that they think that elves are intrinsically better craftsmen than them. Elves cheat because they can develop their craft for millennia. And how can we, like, and they feel, in, so what we're seeing is the awkward beginnings of this feeling of, in, of frustration uh, in the inadequacy brought about by the mortality situation, and the elves don't have that, and we're upset. Except that that isn't ever uh, the way it's manifested in the text. And I know, I know, this is an adaptation. I'm not, we're not talking I'm not about trying the to text, say that Alan. <laughs> we're talking <laughs> we're about the, the show. Right. <laughs> and I would have liked to have seen the adaptation remain a little more faithful there in the sense that the gripe was first, you know, hey, why can't we go and see our friends? Why, why can't we, who are mighty on, on Arda, why can't we get in our boats and sail over there and visit our friends at, at Tol Erasea? Uh, and... And then, of course, you know, we get some who say, "Well, why why shouldn't we even go to Valinor and, and you know go there even for the for for a day to taste this glory of immortality?" It's I, never phrased as an immortality issue. It's phrased as an economics issue. I don't disagree with you that it can portray that. I, no, but I think that that was, and I felt that was actually not only implicitly there was there was explicit reference to the fact that mortality and immortality was what was esta- they were. Talking about it in economic terms, well, not even economic. They were talking in terms of cultural craftsmanship, and, yeah, oh, yeah, cultural, because yeah. cra- that's how they that was how they defined their cultural mm-hmm. value. I'm going to interject here, please do for a moment. Uh, yes, I didn't love how that scene was written. It yeah. came across as. Uh, contemporary to our culture, yes. not contemporary yes. to Numenor. Yes. Resonated a little too directly. Correct. Yes. So yeah. especially the drinks all around. Oh my goodness! You know. yeah. So yeah. I didn't love that. But um, what I think is interesting, and we kind of opened this thinking about tradition and modernity in Numenor, and Which I is think where I was going to seamlessly take you. So uh, I think seamless. just Thanks. well just done, everyone. Well it. done. Um, I think Farazon has had to walk a difficult line, and mm. I think. He has been very carefully, particularly we saw it in season one, and then season two, it's been a bit up and down, but he's been more on the up. Um, but I think he was very carefully making sure that he didn't step out of line. He he was the chancellor. He couldn't right. just say what he wanted. Maybe he was also slightly testing the waters. Like, at this moment, we haven't been overtly, openly anti-the faithful in the show we haven't seen them being like right lock them all up tear down the temples and so i have a feeling that the uh, i think at any rate tristan gravel would tell us as the actor i think he would say that in his mind it was i'm being careful about what i say because at this point i'm not in a high enough status position where i can just come out here and say we want immortality don't we guys screw the elves and so he's sort of pacifying the crowd that's fair seeming to walk a line where he's not going against tar palantir not alienate people but testing the waters and i think there's a lot of very cunning uh use of language again that scene wasn't particularly well written but um from farazon where he's not open about things that may be taking root in his mind that may be where he wants to push us um, but he's 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 a um, a politician. Yeah, he's playing politics. I can see that. I mean, certainly he's not in the position of king. He doesn't have that authority. Whereas in the text, all we're hearing from are the kings. Yes, right? I mean the kings are the ones saying, "Why can't we do this? Why can't we do this? What about my father Elros? You know, he's li- he's or Elros. Um, <laughs> I can't even think. Right. Um, you know, isn't he right. there? Well, yeah, but he yeah. has his fate apart. Blah blah right. blah. We're not getting any of that. And that's the thing. Again, although it was clumsily done in some ways. That's what I liked about that, the 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 anti-elf scene, is that we were getting that from a commoner on Numenor situation, mm-hmm. 
and I liked the idea, like as a piece of fill in the blanks world building, as an idea of like, okay, your average Numenorian on the street in this pre Numenorian militaristic age, mm-hmm. like when they're not defining themselves by their military right. power, how would they define that? What what would be the position of greatest prestige yeah. in Numenor? Well, clearly all the guilds, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the guilds. I know we're going back to a lot well. of season one stuff. I right. thought that was a fun yeah, answer. That was. But we got that was a fun more in season one to lay these foundations, exactly. so it right. makes yeah. sense for us no, to take it as a big picture. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, so anyway, I, okay. I, I, I thought that that was. I thought that that was. Very, and so therefore, to see how the mm-hmm. way the the elves are going to, you know, are going to 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 you know, take our crafts from us mm-hmm. is a way of, again, translating the beginnings, the the the, the ground level rumblings mm. of the immortality problem among the commoners, which like to show what Farazon's going to build on. Right. Right. And therefore, why when things when the pace accelerates, right, when Muriel comes out of the closet as mm-hmm. one of the faithful and gains a following, right, yeah. and gives it prestige, the king's funeral. Right. 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 And, and Farazon's like, oh, shit. Yeah. I got a stamp on this now yes. yeah. because I was gradually building up the anti-elf thing, but now, now I'm at risk of uh, now yeah. I've got to yeah. make sure there is no yeah. and and so he Trust seizes the seizes the moment with the eagle. That is yeah. one you know? thing. They're very opportunistic. I mean, it, and and we have seen that totally. Yeah. Like I'll I'll fi- I will concede that that may be the point. I will mm-hmm. say that it was so clumsily done that I couldn't see it. And I didn't, and I, I still don't enjoy it. But when that was kind of also an example of the the tradition versus modernity thing that we were talking about, that there are a lot of elements of that, you know, the the sensationalism taking advantage of the moment that feels very modern, modern. that feels mm-hmm. very well political in a the, modern sense. Mm-hmm. That's so. The thing that I find really interesting about the tradition versus modernity is like, what is modern? Because yeah. in one sense, faithfulness is the newest is is the in thing. Mm-hmm. When Muriel is briefly about to be septrified um <laughs> the now a verb that now a verb um yeah i was admitting that like although yes it's awkward to call it a coronation because there's, there's no, no crown. actual crown yeah. but there's no better word no <laughs> like you get there's yeah, septrification just no. yeah no it doesn't work anyway consecrated installation Install, install. It's being installed. Is the it's, it's, right. Let's stick to coronation. Yeah. That Sounds works. Sounds like something you'd hire a contractor. Know, yeah, exactly. right. <laughs> exactly. I'm gonna have an installation right here. Yeah, is it? Anyway, it was fine. Um, so, um, the wave. So anyway, it's not j- the way that they played with it. That on the one hand, yes, you have the idea of the ancient tree, like the f- being of member of the faithful is looking back at the old 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 ways right um but we don't see those no. those are already passe and tar palantir is you know uh has been functionally banished yeah. for supporting it mm-hmm. so when Miri- at the beginning of season two it looks like Farazan is the one who is the leader of the old ways from which muriel is departing like modernity is the way of the faithful and uh our pharazon represents the uh, a more conservative numenorean conservative within their context way of looking at things yeah. um but then things shift around right and we get this larger sense of and the way i keep um in my analysis talking about how kemen thinking about that first speech and the way that he's like pharazon's instrument right mm-hmm. he's the one sent out to do the yeah. things right um and his youthfulness and frankly even his clumsiness and insecurity point to like he is the new numenor that they're that they're trying to establish so it's not j- they create a more complicated situation than just old ways faithful versus new ways kingsmen it's like competing visions mm-hmm. of the new ways. Well, and you see Farazon kind of imposing the tradition by the, the trial of Midiel. Yes. That Farazon is like, right, presumably just because he's pretty sure she's going to die. And right. like, well, yeah. Well, that takes <laughs> that problem, takes care yeah. of that. Right. Um, it's, but he's saying, let's go back to right. the ancient, uh, these strange ancient ways that we don't know. We've never heard of it before. But anyway, uh, but neither the had they. Well, I mean, they had to get out that old archaic book and be like, "Hey, yeah. did you ever this hear like an illuminated manuscript?" Yeah. Oh, wow, do look you, at this. Do you, oh, 
fuck how you dredged that up from like, where? Do you yeah. think that and yeah. there was yeah. no conversation like, can you turn the page? Is there another one is that doesn't context? involve a serpent? Also, it's like, is the serpent still down there? Yeah, do, do they, we know? They all Should still we seem check to know if about this serpent? <laughs> but anyway. No. But so he is kind of using, but again, he's smart. He'll use anything. Oh, yeah. So if he can use some ancient tradition mm-hmm. to back up his argument, he's going to do it. If he can use some old custom to get rid of his enemies, he's going to do it. But so it's an all or nothing play. Because uh, uh, that's the thing. He realizes that the risk of her actually surviving is next to nil. Right. right. And if she doesn't, then he's got absolute lock on everything. I mean, it's, a, right. it's a total win. But that tiny, slim chance that she is going but to survive. But he very quickly finds a way out of that, too. He does, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. But it's like, oh, she bewitched the sea. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and Which that's is pretty like amazing classic. because the Numenorean crowd is very fickle, clearly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they, they were all behind Muriel until the eagle shows up and you get, Farazan. Farazan. <laughs> and even though the and eagle's like, the eagle's like, who are you I talking don't know about? What? what? You choose, yeah. Like, the <laughs> The, I if, love the if there was ever a time for an yeah. eagle to actually speak, <laughs> since they can, who why knew eagles? That guy I wanted the eagle just to be like, <laughs> <laughs> just you know, chomp, like, chomp nope, not you. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't realize, you. I didn't realize. I didn't realize eagles could roll their eyes. So <laughs> yeah. that was, you know. yes, that yeah. eagle definitely was rolling yeah. his eyes. But yeah, I mean, that's it, it's. it's I did think it was kind of a beautiful moment, though. Was, I have to say, the eagle was it just fantastic. it's so epic. Yeah, the yeah. arrival of an eagle is something else. So. um Ancient traditions and the sea worm. Can I go back to that for yeah, a second? Yeah, let's. Okay. So here's something I still don't understand. Um, we have the old illuminated manuscript, mm-hmm. which shows the sea worm as basically the instrument of the Valar's as judgment. The Valar, yes. Right. Okay. And this is, and it's dredged up as like, hey, th- basically this is a clever. We're going to use your freaky archaic beliefs against you right right Right? so if you're behind these freaky archaic beliefs well here's a freaky archaic thing Mm -hmm. we dredge this up in like the ye old book of freaky archaic faithful things and if you say no you're not faithful clearly right right exactly so true ruler would not right if you're if you're you're for old things then you must even be like you're going to stick by the trial by abyss right even though that sounds crazy i think even to the modern numenorians it sounds crazy okay but so so but here's my question so if the sea worm, according to the old traditions, mm-hmm. if the sea worm is the instrument of the Valar, right? do you remember, I think, Maggie, I bet you will remember this because we talked about this. Mm-hmm. Do you remember when we saw the sea worm depicted in Numenorean art, other than in the book? We saw it in the fresco on the wall in the like restaurant where mm-hmm. a Lendl family was yeah. having that awkward family dinner. Yes. Yep. And we see the sea worm rising out of the sea and Numenorians stabbing it with spears. It was a fight with the sea yeah. worm by the Numenorians. What do we think is the um, provenance of that fresco? Right. And what does what do these two images tell mm. us? If it's the voice of the Valar, why about, are you allowed to yeah, stab about it? The yeah. the yeah. <laughs> well, for me, there's a um, a, a sort of a fragrance, if you will, of Greek mythology there. Yes. Mm-hmm. So you it see feels that like Andromeda in, yeah, and, yeah, or it feels to me like um, the sea worm washing up on and eating. Oh, now I can't remember the name of the prince. Laos, I think, is the priest who gets eaten by the sea worm. But anyway, there was a sense in a lot of Greek mythology that a creature could be of the gods and could also be a creature that you were terrified of yeah, and that yeah. you didn't want swallowing your ship or swallowing right. your children off the shore or, or whatever. Or like the Caledonian boar. Or, yeah, yeah lots of exactly. Monsters. And yeah. so I think a monster can at one and the same time be something that you don't want it just randomly attacking your shore or attacking your no. ships. But you also recognize that it might be a voice piece of the gods and that there are times when you use that and you mm-hmm. say, ah, oh, well, this reveals to us a truth or... You know, um, and, it, and it could be you know the tradition of rules that there are certain situations in which the sea monster becomes the voice of the Valar. So otherwise, it's a threat. But in this specific right. moment, somehow it knows the rules right. and follows them. Right. Which is, and that seems to me the difference with the Greek situation. Right. Um, what I, I mentioned the Caledonian boar. Right. So the Cal- this is that's another classic. It's not an aquatic one, so it's not as close a parallel. But it's a similar kind of situation where it's like you know you tick off one of the gods. In that case, 
I think Diana, wasn't it? Anyway, um, you, you take off one of the gods, and then she's like, I'm mad. I'm going to make this monstrous creature just set it loose in the land to punish you. Right. And on the one hand, that is it's the it's the messenger of the goddess. Right. right. And her message is I'm going to I'm stomping I'm you, you right now because yeah, right? I'm, I'm annoyed. Right. Um, and the moral of the story is the gods are f- like, don't take off the gods because yeah. they're f- they will stomp on you and, and loose monsters on you. But the Caledon, the Caledonian boar, like the monster that gets unleashed doesn't is not in communication with Diana, right? I mean, no. she, oh, right. it's it's right, just kept in a box. It's just, a and it's just, it's, it. it's just an yeah. instrument. Whereas, like again, like the sea worm, the sea worm knows the script. Yeah. The sea worm right. seems to be like to be an instrument of judgment, not just the means by which retribution is going right. to be unleashed. But but so not the executioner's axe, right? But but the an judge, actual, but the judge of the. But that's how they yeah. interpret the power. it. That's yeah. how they interpret right. it, right? Right. So right. It, but that's important. It might, how they interpret exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that the sea worm actually no. is in communication. It's just no. they interpret it that's as correct. such. So the story I was trying to think of, and I still can't remember the priest's name, but it's in the Trojan War when the Trojan horse is there and he is the one person saying, don't take it into Troy. And, yeah. and Laocoon, um, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I yeah. said Laos, didn't I? And it's Laocoon, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so the sea monster eats him and they're like, oh, that must mean right. that we should. Right. Take it in because he was lying to us. But it's all about how you interpret it. Now, he could have just been eaten. Yeah, exactly. Just for me, yeah. yeah. For me, the big difference is that the Valar, as far as we are aware, and we've talked about this in another discussion, don't behave like the Greek gods yes. did. Yes, yes. They're the not whimsical That's and vengeful this, yeah. and lustful and, you know. Which is why it's possible that the trial by abyss worked. Because it actually is the mouth of. If or a judge for the Valar? The ju- uh, if the Valar don't act like the Greek gods and do would act, would respond in justice, again, you still have to assume the link between the sea worm and the, and the Valar, right? Right, and you still have to wonder Which why a, there'd be a mural of it randomly attacking people. Um, or them randomly attacking it. And one is or the it other, the same yes. one that Halbrand encountered? Is it the same one? If it is, what's going on there? That sheds a whole different light on that. If this mm-hmm. C1 does have some. He had a conversation with it. He might have had some influence over it. Does that affect the decision that was made? You know, were some plans laid there? And that's, of course. I don't know if we're supposed to think about it this much. <laughs> and if. No, I don't think and there's ever any limit on how hard we're supposed I to was think. Say. That would be unfair. It would be unfair for them to ask us to do so much work and then and to and assume we're not going to do it. Like, come on. Like, that's that's hard. If this is ancient, <laughs> if this is yeah. the, sort of their ancient beliefs, then you would think that it's a belief that actually was when they were all more faithful. Yes. It does make very little sense because they would have been in contact with the Eldar. Well,. Oh, Hang by on the a way, second. Could you wait, 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 wait. Monway. But by saying it doesn't make any sense, you mean you're assuming that it's wrong. I don't believe it. It makes sense if the sea worm is the instrument of the valor. Why don't you believe it is? Give him a sec. I, I, yeah, I was good. Thank you. You're because welcome. He does, he does I put us on know. The spot. Right. Breathe. <laughs> there we go. It is, by its appearance, an arbitrary thing. Yes, I know you're saying what if he is in contact with. Th- there's no message. It's a binary decision. Yes. Innocent or guilty. That's a message. Or not. Yeah. There's no room for an explanation of justice. There's no... Think about the way that, that the Valar send messages to Numenor. They okay. send them through the Eldar. The elves come and say, you can't be immortal. And even if you could show up on Amman, it isn't the land itself that would make you deathless. It's the deathless that dwell there that make this land amazing. You would burn out like a moth in a flame. They send words. They don't send serpents. It's not consistent with the way that the Valar Hang send on. messages to the people of Numenor. You're talking about the book again, Alan. I know I am. But it's <laughs> an adaptation of a book. Oh. But so this is the thing. But I think we, the Do we have any indication that any words have ever come from the elves or from Valinor? In the f- not I, in the show. Uh, exactly. No, exactly. So why so are we talking about that? We're being asked <laughs> to accept <laughs> something that, that I think Alan feels goes against... Is it in the spirit of Tolkien is often the question That's that the we're asking. Is it like, doesn't have to be the book, but is it in the spirit of exactly. Tolkien? Exactly. Filling in the blanks works. I have no problem with filling in the blanks, but filling in the blanks in a way that is inconsistent with. How is it inconsistent? With. It's in I, conflict with because it's how? not 
Okay. Okay. Well, I am slow down. Down. Just said I think no, this is a really interesting conversation, but I also think we're starting we're to talk. We're end up digressing. Yeah, way we're too digressing, far. but we're also starting to talk about these really many things that we don't have additional correct. information on. That so what correct. I want us to do is look a little bit more about what we do have information on. That's fair. And I'm not just taking his side. I'm saying what we uh-huh. have is the the material that we have on screen. Right. Mm-hmm. Is what I think we're working from. Okay. But the deeper so conversation. So if there is no book. But the deeper com- stands on its But own. the deeper conversation about the rules that we have, we are so ingrained with the information that we do have from Correct. the book, and we know the showrunners have the same information. And that's the thing. So it's not like we these people can't are working help. In the back right. We right. can't help but take all of that into consideration and say, but they know this. So therefore, but we don't. So like, what are we but actually I, seeing? Pretend no one has right, ever I think heard of a, Tolkien or read Silmarillion. What are we actually seeing? An issue that, okay. that they are, well, you raised, mm-hmm. that they're kind of contradicting themselves. Yeah. Because why is there a freeze of a creature that is supposedly revered and respected at, because it's believed as being a judge from the Valar? Why is there a picture of it kind of, uh, uh, hang you know? Theory. One, one l- tiny little moment, though. I feel like we have to remember this was in a restaurant. Like, think of some of the paintings you've seen on a Pizza Hut wall. <laughs> right. Maybe it was a seafood place. <laughs> yeah. It was Rainforest I mean, Cafe. It they could be it. that right. they took some Greek god and turned it into a cartoon. Like okay, we, actually, we don't know the context. Hang on. Hang Next on up that. in your Happy Meal, uh, uh, the sea worm. <laughs> that, right. 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 Let's assume that. Disnification. That tells us something really interesting about their society, though. It certainly tells us that the sea worm isn't sacred anymore. Oh, that's like, true. I There's mean, the, the that's uncomfortable. Like, like, remember that welcome to the restaurant of blasphemy, right? Yeah. Wait, 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 I mean, seriously. Remember that stupid old belief people used to have? Right, Let's exactly. Let's draw right? that on the wall. Yeah, ex- in fact, like, it, th- that but makes brain, it seem like a mockery. My brain's going to Buddy Christ, though, you know? Like, that's th- where my mind dogma. Went. Like, yep. there are certain oh. ways that you can take the the deification of right. an image and play with it without mm-hmm. being disrespectful too. So who knows is my, my summary of it's this? Possible. I know that but what have we seen and what yeah. is that telling us? That's fair. I guess the, my problem is Thanks. I'm going to be arguing from the book so I just need to put my mic down and stop talking. But well, <laughs> so stop. There's right. no problem. I mean, like obviously I'm not trying to we have to pretend the book doesn't right. exist, but what we can't do is just substitute book for film. Yeah. Okay. We have to be think about what the film is saying. We can think about it in relationship to the book. What we can't do is say this thing that is true from the book must be true for the film and therefore judge it on that basis. Okay, that's fair. I understand that. I, I guess the thing is it's not only this is not the way the Valar communicate. I think of the trajectory of Numenor. They started here and the entire story of Numenor was a fall. Yeah. Right. The story of a sea worm being the dispenser of justice is a primitive story a, a mythological older story that an advanced society no longer right. believes. That is to say, a society that goes on this curve instead of a society that's going on this curve. Okay. You think about how we, we read in the appendices about how yeah. all the lore, all the scientific knowledge, yeah. all the crafts and artsmanship yeah. that all sank down with Numenor, they had scientific knowledge. Yeah. This is a very anti science sort of concept. But I think we're we're getting I think we're getting a, an abbreviated version of a, a curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I think I actually think and hope that we haven't yet seen Numenor at its height in the TV show. In the TV show. Right? Yeah. And so because we're about we to have, have text, armadas, yeah. we're yeah. about to right, have right. the yeah. full might that well, is going to go. Our, and it has reached our the first zenith of its bliss, if not its might. If not its might. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. That, that is yeah. So fair. I think we might be seeing, uh, you know, obviously it, it was in the books, we kind of went a little bit up and then... Long, long, long way right. down. Okay. We're just kind of doing this in the TV yep. show, but I, I, yeah. I think well, it has to be I'm okay with that. So, um, so Alan, having pressed you very hard, sure, yeah, I'm now going to turn around and, and agree with you. Well, thank you. And I'm going because so this is exactly why I was probing this, right, right. And for some reason, my wife says this kind of thing drives me crazy or drives her crazy when I do this. I don't know why, but anyway, I, I, I was pushing hard. I feel like we should also that. say you guys know these are. For the friends, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, right. they enjoy this yeah, yeah, yeah. an absurd amount. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 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 okay. So I'm gonna brag about this. Actually, <laughs> the reason I was podcast. the reason I was pushing really hard at that because I wanted to. I want as I'm trying trying to think that through because here's the th- here's the way in which I also am uncomfortable with the trial by abyss for exactly the reason you that's that the word primitive yeah. that you used right because here's the thing I think we clearly get indicators that the modern worship of the faithful is ignorant that yeah. it has fallen from genuine knowledge right. of the valar this the frankly superstitious belief that this statue of 
Nienna, right. though she's not named because no legal rights. reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the statue of Nienna, if the statue of Nienna is not taken with them from the shrine, then this is actually going to affect the yeah. afterlife destiny yeah. of these souls? I caught that. That, that make does sense. not make that sense. Job at all. That's superstition. Yeah. yeah. And that seems to be, the, uh, while on the one hand they're trying to cling to the old traditions, I think they don't understand the old they traditions don't have, anymore. Right. They don't have the full picture anymore because of the cutoff of the communication from the right. Eldar. Because this very much has that feeling of like, what else floats on water? Right. 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 Exactly. I mean, so, yes. Primitive S witchcraft. And it seems, therefore, that we can see a trajectory the modern faithful worship has elements of sort of ignorance and superstition, mm -hmm. in, not how the Valar actually work. And the okay. in illustrated manuscript also, because it does feel primitive. It right. does, cause I agree that like it's, it in some ways it does feel more like Greek gods than yeah. like the Valar. Yeah. Um, they must, well, not, it's not, a, they must be a propitiated thing, but still, I, as you like, I agree with that. Um, at the same time, we get this you catastrophic usage of it. Exactly. And the shot of the sea worm, I'm not sure. When I consider the sea worm as a character in season two, yeah. I'm not sure in the end, I think they're accidentally right. Mm -hmm. And you actually, know? yeah, I, I'm with you on that. Yeah. I think there is something to be said for the fact that they're approaching <laughs> this right. entirely wrong, and yet somehow yeah. there is a connection yes. between right. the sea worm yes. and, and the Valar. Whether that is you know, uh, the Valar using a beast or whether that is Osse himself, yeah, yeah. you know, in, yeah. in some sort of beast form, yeah. which it could be. It would be an interesting concept. I was going to take it somewhere else. Do you have a final thought on that? So my my last thought and thing that I want to just kind of chat through a little bit is is Elendil. So he's yes. had quite oh, the trajectory I was here. Really I hoping. know. Mm. I mean, I absolutely loved the vision that he had in the plant here and playing that out yes. through film analysis yeah. and talking about yeah. what we were looking at and how he turned and what we mm -hmm. were seeing and then seeing that exact moment recreated right. in in real life. Where is he going? Where do you guys see him? I mean, we know story-wise where he's going, but where right. do you see yeah. the actual like, trajectory? Mount of Doom. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually, yes. Right. By way going. of Antunier, yeah. and then by way of uh, Romenda. And but then, let's talk know. about his arc a little bit and what, yeah. and what we're looking at uh, now. One of my favorite characters in the whole and actors. television. And Well, yes. I mean, oh. Lloyd Owen is fantastic. And I think when you and I got a chance to sit across from him at the table oh, that was the best. a couple of years ago, it was just one of the highlights of my experience. Uh, yeah find out that he listens to you and that he listens to me it was just like kind yeah. of eye-opening did you fan girl did, did you fan oh. i did yeah um, well and and yeah. it w was so charming is that he was so full of questions oh, yeah. for us you know i think he was, was more excited to see us than yes. we were to see him yeah it was, really, it was really fun uh i mean he clearly has embraced this role he's he's dug into this yes. and he's worked hard at understanding who book elendil is even if yes. he is having to act you know as, uh, per yeah. what the script says but yeah. as for his storyline I'm really enjoying this. I mean, I, I get that we're getting the reluctant Elendil at first, the guy who's not sure that he's really part of the faithful. It sort of echoes the the sort of emo Aragorn that we get of the Jackson films. Who's but so less much confidence. less emo. But less yeah, emo, much exactly. Much less emo. He's just yeah. a little, like, Shy. maybe not sure. Right? Yes, yes. As, as opposed to totally doubtful. Yeah. Uh, and and to get the, the growth that we've seen in him is just fantastic. And, and, and obviously peaking with the moment where he gets Narsil. Mm hmm yeah. Yeah. Which was an, a nice moment. That, that was a wonderful nice moment. moment. And again, another, we've talked about callbacks before visually and dialogue-wise. This was a very visual callback to the moment where Aragorn pulls yep. out a sword. Same. Yeah, I would have They, they would have actually chopped Elrond's head off. <laughs> I would scene. have loved it to look less yes, visually a little like bit less. I was like, oh, come on, guys. You don't have to you make don't have it to be that quite on the nose. obvious. <laughs> but it was okay. It, but it was um, still It's funny. A I missed moment. that. But I think that's because I dislike that scene in the uh, Jackson film. Yeah, so I try not to think about it. Exactly, yeah. I, I, I do as well. But it was an interesting callback, and it worked a little bit. I did feel like it was a miss. This is not a gripe. I'm just going to get a little bit of word nerdery going on here. Nar Silly talks about it being, uh, 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 the, how did he call it? The, the white flame. The white flame. Yeah. It's actually the red and white flame. And I know that sounds the most pedantic <laughs> thing in the world. Dear reader, it is. <laughs> but let me explain why. Because the two elements, Nar and Sil, right? Nar is son. And look at the name of one of his sons, Anarian. Mm -hmm. And Sil, look at the name of his other son, is Sildur. This is the light of the sun and moon that will defeat Sauron. Right. And it was just, just this 
I just wanted that so badly. It was like they scored a field goal and they could have put it over the goal line and scored a touchdown, but it was still good. Maybe he'll still scored points. Maybe he'll contemplate it. He was sight translating. He was. You know, he was. Maybe maybe he'll think about it more later. Go, Wait a minute. Or there's I a little my tarnish sons after these as things. it happens. What? Yes. Or there's a little yeah. tarnish on the hilt and I'm like, oh, that's what it is. Oh, oh, I missed light that. Of sun and light. Moon. I really I do like that, and I love that it is the light of those heavenly bodies, the light yeah. of the trees yeah. yes. that defeats Sauron yeah, in exactly. the end. It's yeah. fantastic. No, so. I, I love how his character has grown. And again, considering how relatively little we've seen, yes. yeah. they've he's managed got so little screen time. Yeah. And they've managed to, to build it without it being like, well, why is he suddenly there? Like, this is right. one of the ones, there are a lot of moments in season two where I'm like, oh, no, we, we're asking to make a jump. Yes. But I didn't feel that right. with Elendil. I felt like, okay, I know. And even his relationship with Miriel, which there's, it's always dangerous when you start being like, there's going to yes. be romance. <laughs> you know, it's always like, oh, no, is it going to be cringeworthy? But actually, I think they handled it beautifully. Yeah, they, they did. did. They did. It's, um, a very, it's a very mature relationship yes. between yeah. the two and of them. And, and the the focus yeah. they consistently have on duty and responsibility. Yes, and he is keeps just his and deference loyalty to her. And honor the yes. whole way. He's always keeps got the deference boundaries. to her. You just yeah. see this great um, affection that yeah. has grown between them, and and uh, all tied up in the loyalty and yeah. respect. Yeah, yeah. and what they're now their fighting no. against. Yes, the yeah. the the. the menace that has come out into the open this mm -hmm. very yeah. real threat to the things that they now recognize as being important yeah. that maybe in season one they weren't sure about they and then they went and they fought and they recognized the threat and they recognized the need of the elves and all of this stuff and now they come home and it's like well shit all hell is breaking loose <laughs> right. here now yeah. um and so i thought that was all very nicely handled i'm really excited to see him go west I mm -hmm. really want to see him reunited with Anarion. I really want to know yeah. why he's been hiding away. Right. We, I'm not going to go into it because we talked about it in our Q&A yesterday, but who else might be in the <laughs> west of Numenor? Right. Yes. What else might, you know, I yes. think he is one of the characters that at the end of season two, I'm like, okay, great stuff yes. lies ahead, and yes. I can't wait to see that. I just hope that somehow he does get back and, and that he and Isildur don't. I, I don't want to see them miss each other. Uh, right. I want to right. make sure he knows that his son is right. alive. Right. Uh, After presuming Isildur were dead for a whole season, yeah. Isildur comes back and starts presuming his father dead. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, please don't do that. Don't. Such a no. cop out. Yeah. That um, would be. I do wonder what's going to happen to his daughter. Sure. Yeah. This is a question sure. mark for I don't. me. <laughs> your your you still rings think of power bingo. So. 100%. I think yeah. she's going to get, yeah. She's Nazgul. Already. You think she's Nazgul still? Nazgul all okay, day long. Because because short for a Nazgul. We <laughs> she's going to be adorable. She's going to be <laughs> the, the most adorable. Nazgul. The cutest Nazgul. <laughs> but we were Come talking on. about this earlier, yeah. and, and um, it's interesting because she clearly, she and Kemen both were being set up to be mm -hmm. like just villainous. Yeah. yeah. But then, towards the end of season two, there seem she to had be moments of humanity, a softening, and and so she's got a long way to go back yeah. to be full on ring race villainy. Well, but I think the mere fact that she's a member of the Architects Guild is laying the groundwork well. for what she's going to do. Doesn't bode uh, well. I have a feeling she's going to be involved. Although in the they Temple really of didn't focus on that very much no, this season. I think Hardly it's, just, yeah. it's just it's just mentioned in season yeah. one, and, no, and that she's a guild member yes. comes yeah. up. But yes. yeah. we don't even we're not even reminded which guild. So right. somehow being a member of the Architects and Guild gives her authority to say take the weapons away from the soldiers. But well, that, yeah, I don't obviously, that, but yeah. very important. And, and move along. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> so I was like, "What? More Star Wars creeping in?" I know. <laughs> Move along. Um, Come on now. <laughs> 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 once you, you need to tell Darth Vader if you're yeah, exactly. once you start looking for Move it. Move along. Yeah. These aren't the faithful you're looking for. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, she doesn't Jedi um, mind tricks? <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally, she does. She totally. orders them. She or, but she she asserts her authority. But as it's like, very odd that she. I'm the unofficial lackey of our family. Yeah, I don't know how she suddenly gets that. It's just it's a woman with confidence. It's well, she's the quasi official lackey. She is. Yeah. Because after the after, but she, why is she? Because she was the architect of the uh, undoing Ooh. of Muriel. She's Ooh. the one who comes. She's like, I, I've, I've got the, the architect. Engineer problem. I know that was nicely played. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah, I just kind of sure noticed that. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, yeah, yeah, you so think she gets promoted because she at the dinner the party Palantir. at the okay. pub? All right. right? She's the They're tool. like, right. oh right. man, this is this is horrible. What's like, going on? And she's like. I got, I got you. An I got you, man. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Right. So all you gotta do is have me like let me stand awkwardly near you after this, and, and I'll, I'll bring out this thing I stole. Yeah, I'll, I'll make help this. Yeah, I'll do you a solid. I'll, exactly. Yeah. I'll make this work for you. Fair enough. And then but she again, rolls it down and picks up the seven ten split. Yeah. 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 It would have been good to 
kind of just have a moment where Farazon, Farazon says, you have done me good yes. service. Yes. Yes. That's what yeah. it would have yeah. been Again, another like, cutting room oh. floor scene. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, she, uh, now I'd see why she has power. But yeah, I, I think she's going to end up being the yeah. builder, so th the architect of the temple. But the, but the, the interesting thing to me at the very, very end, right? On the one hand, she's clearly pivoting. Like that yeah. she seems to in that moment when she felt betrayed because she called the faithful together and didn't know why. And I was like, oh, I am in fact uh, the perpetrator of this persecution than, uh, that unbeknownst to me and against right. my will. Right. right. Um, uh, I am uncomfortable with this. And she and Art Farazan exchanged a, a glance. Like yeah. he saw her discomfort. Yes. And he's aware of Well, this that is one of, of the reasons that I think she might be on a different journey. I still she think might she be. might be yeah. the architect of the Temple of Morgoth. I get that. Yeah. But I think because. It, we've talked before about the protected characters. Yeah. Elendil, yeah. Isulda, and Arian, they all have to escape yes, Numenor. Yes, they do. Yeah. There she has does to not. be somebody we care about going down. Miniel presumably is going to have gone... We'll get finally get to see the top of the mental tarma at the end of that. Right. No, I think, yeah. I think, I think so Muriel is that. Oh, you do? I think Muriel's... She'll, she'll go down with the ship. There is one other the possibility island. for Arian. That is. And that she's she's either going to be a ringwraith, yeah. which I still believe, yeah. or she's going to be the Miradanya of Numenor and will be the first sacrifice mm. in the temple that she built. Well, and even and if she does become a ringwraith, that's still a sacrifice. That's still oh, yeah. a loss. You yeah, know? Yeah. So, I mean, either way, she's not going to win this one. No, she's not. No. And no. neither is Kevin. I think Kevin's oh. destined oh, for Kevin's, a black yeah, but uh, Kevin's, yeah. or he might, for me, he might even be the witch king. I'm just, because he is now the I son the of a king. king. Such a wuss. I was going to say, he's too much a of a wet blanket. First, really. yeah. I, I get all of all that, right. but he's he's got a lot of growing up to do. He might learn all kinds. take us away from Kevin. Okay, He's part of Numenor. I'm going to wrap us up, but I'm, yeah. He's part of Numenor. Numenor, can we talk Final about? thoughts. Final, okay, just last quick Arian thing. Yeah, yeah. Where they, it, okay, where they left us with her mm -hmm. at the end of the season, right? She has stepped out on a limb, chosen her father over our yes. Farazan, and thus estranged herself mm -hmm. from our Farazan. She's gonna have to earn his trust back. But what happens? She goes down to rescue him, tells him, save yourself turns the guards away, goes back to look for her father, who presumably is extremely grateful to her, right? <laughs> she turns around <laughs> waiting <laughs> to be embraced by her father. Thank uh -uh. you, Aarian. You've saved me and saved us all. And he's nowhere to be yeah. found. <laughs> right. Because he's gone to the person who's more important than That's she is. Correct. The one whom he was having an intimate moment with that she was watching through the bars of the prison That's right. with like... Edible discomfort, right? I mean, it was so anyway, like it was like I mean, it, she was not okay with the romantic no, interlude no. with Muriel, no. right? She felt like she was almost betraying her principles by bringing Muriel to him in the first place, yeah. but she thought she was only betraying her political principles, yeah. And then she's like, oh no, this is this is way no. worse than I thought, yeah. <laughs> right? When she's I'm watching not liking that. this, and so and I so I think we last see her standing there, I think, feeling betrayed by her father, mm -hmm. who's like, oh, so here I am having having put myself in danger for you. Right. I am now chopped liver, and you're going off to right. that 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 woman, that, uh, that, that woman. her yeah. again. Right. Though to be fair to him. He wouldn't have been in danger without her. Oh, totally. Oh, no, no, no. So, I'm, I'm yeah. not even defending her no, point no, of view. No, no. I'm but just saying like, that her. might be where, how she feels. Where she here. is set yeah. up. So she is not just in the middle, I think, of heading back. She's in no man's land. Yeah, she right. is. she's stuck in the middle. Um, which uh, it's is never a great a good place, place to be. for Sauron to play. I mean, oh, he's going to, yeah, yeah. He, he will. What you need when you're all on your own like that is. A, a, a loving of, hand. A source of power <laughs> of your own, you know. Yes, well, and we I'm know so that's sad. where this going. And, and we were talking in the Cause of Doom segment about the allure of the rings and the draw of that power. I mean, yes. you can just see the stage is set mm -hmm. so strongly in Numenor for it's that the, to be stepped it's into. It's going to be the Farazon Sauron thing, that though. Yeah. I just can't yeah. wait. And I think the strength of that will be that Farazon will know what Sauron is yes. and will yes. still, still think still. Exactly. Well, just yeah, like Kelebrimbor did yeah. Yeah. Kelebrimbor could tell hey right. you're really good at making people think that 
Yeah. Their ideas, th- your ideas yeah. are, are your ideas. own. Yeah. Yes, but e- like, but even more explicitly. Oh yeah, because yeah, I am Sauron the Deceiver. Yes, and I am still, still going, going to, to deceive. <laughs> yeah, Celebrimbor yes. could, yes. could, yes. could try to convince himself that this was a Valar, and he was, right. you know, trying to just support something really good. No, no. Farazhan's right. going to be like, no, I'll be on your team. He's evil. They're yeah. going to each think they're going to be able to manipulate yeah. the yes. other, but yeah. Farazhan is definitely he's out of his He's going to lose, but he's going to think that he can win, and I think that is going to be. Great. I to am see. waiting for the line that great kings take what is their right. Uh, right. Yeah. My my takeaway. I, I, I can't well, disagree yeah. with anything yeah. that they've said about Aryan or about the the confrontation with Sauron and and our photos on. I just have to say, pour one out for Valandil. I know. That, poor that guy. Was, um, that that was just heartbreaking stuff. And I just think of all the things that Elendil has lost. That, that moment. We will just always have Kevin's dislocated shoulder. That's true. Yes, that was. I replayed. I think I'm going to make that crunching that. sound my ringtone. <laughs> yes. That would be deeply satisfying. I, I actually, I really loved that moment. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you completely. know, actually, it, it, unfortunately, it reminded me very much of breaking my collarbone the year before. So I actually didn't like it. But uh, it in terms very of familiar. satisfaction, it yes. landed. So yes. on on that joyful note of sock and one to Kevin, <laughs> we're, we're back where we started. Right. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. We went full circle. So thank you so much for joining us on this segment about Numenor. My goodness, everybody needs a nap now. Take a breather. <laughs> and we will see you next time. Thanks. Okay, folks. Well, I'm here with Alan Sisto from the Prancing Pony podcast, and we're going to address some more questions. Absolutely. So Looking forward some, to it. We've got some, uh, uh, some, some viewer questions, and then maybe okay. we can kind of – Spin off and talk about some other. I'm sure that won't possibly happen. Exactly. I'm sure we will never digress. Yeah, fortunately, yeah, we always are both. I think equally famous yeah. for really staying on absolutely on, on track. Brevity is the soul of wit. Absolutely, and we'll have no truck with that. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> All right, so our first question uh, is from James Lieback, who was interested in the way that visions were incorporated, mm. especially into the power of the three rings. He's yeah. very interested in the way the rings are depicted and and what kind of uh, effects the rings have on people and, and what we can see about their powers and things. And I, too, was very interested in the this trend that we got right away. Yeah. Um, you know, they put the rings on at the end of uh, episode one, mm-hmm. and then the very beginning of episode two, we've got Galadriel in this dreamscape, mm-hmm. right? Which seems, we're, I think we're clearly meant to understand this to yeah. be a Nenya-induced, you know, vision that she's having. Yeah. Um, and it's not the only time, nope. right, that she has this kind of... And uh, it turns out she's not the only one. Because right. Because then Gil-Galad speaks Gil-Galad about his too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that seems to be uh, a sort of a thing. Um, what do you well? So first of all, before we even think about it, because I, I feel like we need to kind of separate these things, right? There's sure. a question of how visions and premonitions and things like that are being treated in the in in the show, mm-hmm. focusing especially on season two, um, and then thinking about the connection to the rings themselves. Right. So with uh, visions, I was actually really interested at how uh, about their. It seemed to be kind of a motif through the yeah. whole season. Yeah, yeah. People having these premonitions, dreams, visions, like the stranger's dreams combined mm-hmm. with, you know, the, these, these ring visions and such. Um, and one clear trend, it seemed to me, is that they all seem to be, I mean, I'm trying to think of examples where they didn't come true. You know, I think they're all pretty accurate. Or they haven't come true yet. Right. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. There are some things which, though most of them did. Yeah, I think most the, of within, them did. Within the yeah. season. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are um, a few that seem to be maybe looking forward a little bit more. Right. At least right. in theory. But. You know, the, the element that I found most tantalizing, mm-hmm. which was repeated in several people's visions, was that top-down view into the caldera of Mount Doom. Yes. Yeah. Right? Several. I mean, we first see that in The Stranger's Dream, mm-hmm. and it's the most difficult to... I mean, we got it for like two frames. Yeah, it was on there for really, really quick. Really quick. I mean, it's one of those things you had to like pause and frame advance in order to really see it. And even then, you couldn't really tell what it was no, without context. Without context, yeah. And then I think it was in the next episode, we see like we start there and then zoom out and you mm-hmm. see what it is. You see that it's Mount Doom. Yeah. Um, why that element? Mm. And then and he's not the only one who gets it. Like that that no. shot of the caldera comes up in several visions. Um, it, it's to me, it's one of the most tantalizing ones. It is because it didn't get immediate payoff in season two. Right. It's, and most of them did. And that was the one I was thinking of when you yeah. talked about the visions and how they all came true in season two. Right, right, right. We haven't right. seen that one yet. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it is an intriguing kind of 
uh, technique, I suppose you could say, mm -hmm. for the storytellers to sort of build these things out. Uh, I think for me, the first thing that I thought of just in seeing these visions, not so much the stranger's dreams, because those right. are just dreams, yeah. and the stranger is in fact a Maya, so right. therefore this right. makes sense, was the fact that they were utilizing what, what appeared to me to be references to both Galadriel's mirror yep. and to the Palantiri. For sure. Yeah. And and that, because of course the rings themselves were never told that the rings in the texts yeah. actually give any sort of visions or powers like that, any, yeah. any sort of foresight. I mean, yes, elves have foresight. Many of them have right. a lot of foresight. Okay, fine. And there's a lot that we're not told about what the rings do at exactly, all. Exactly. I mean, yeah. 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 So <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. Maybe they've got like you know do free DoorDash or something. They push a button <laughs> and it orders their favorite meal. So all it, kinds of perks. Tolkien's never going to tell about. us, yeah, right? Exactly. Uh, and that's totally fine. So we don't. We're not saying, oh, they're showing visions, and that's not related right. to the text. That's right. just filling in a blank. But it did feel like they were utilizing a tool that we saw, a visual storytelling tool yeah. from the Jackson films, mm -hmm. uh, but finding some other tool to use it with because we don't have the Palantiri yet, not in any place except Numenor. I mean, obviously, our Ferrazan has, has, has had his uh, to, to look at. But the rings are sort of playing that role, especially with Galadriel. And I think it's very much a, a look forward to her mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we see these things, why they may not yet come to be, right? These right. might be things that don't happen. Yes. Um, so I think that was a, a very interesting choice, a, a, in a way, a good choice. I mean, we have another question later on about visual callbacks and we'll get to that, but yeah. this actually is a visual callback that works because it's a technique of storytelling, a visual storytelling. Um, so yeah. this is one of the things that I find really interesting about this kind of thing, both the callback thing. Um, for me, I love it when an adaptation, mm -hmm. whether the choice it's making, whether I like it or don't like it, yeah. whether I think it works or it doesn't work, um, what I like most about it is when it makes when it drives me back to the text, yes, and makes me realize I never understood. So, so like the mirror of Galadriel, yeah. The more these things make me think about Galadriel and her mirror and how she talks about the mirror, the more I realize I have the faintest idea how the mirror of Galadriel works no. or like what it is. She talks about it as if it is not just an extension of her. Right. Like there are many things that the mirror may show yeah. you. She doesn't it's say a third like, party there's thing. a lot that I can tell you using this tool. Right. Right. No, she speaks of it as if she has no control. Correct. Right. It's just, it's just, this is a thing that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and yet she will also say things like remember Galadriel and her mirror, where she is clearly identifying herself with the with mirror. The mirror mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so yeah, like, what what's up with that? Like, yeah. where does that power? Like, what power exactly is she using? Is it just her power? Is there something else? And so, perhaps, well, because I I agree there were some clear moments where we were being invited to think of the yeah. mirror of Galadriel yeah. in connection mm -hmm. with that, um, and it seems like maybe they're they're basically in doing their fill in the blanks thing that they do, you know, mm -hmm. they have to do, you know, for yeah. the sake of so this story. Adaptation is, yeah. Yeah, that they, um, they're basically proposing an answer that the reason she would, because it would make sense yeah. if it were in some sense like, um, so like that later on in her career, mm -hmm. she's able to <laughs> like- and She's the CEO of LaFlorian Incorporated, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's like leveled up, mm -hmm. whatever, she's had an she's now- points for, yeah, into exactly. She's put points into visions. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Every yeah. time she levels, yeah. Exactly, so, so now, her relationship with Nenya is different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that she somehow kind of like distilled this into the mirror. I can see that. Some yeah. Way. I mean, certainly mastery over time of the power right. that the ring gives her would enable her to, to maybe direct the vision a little more clearly. Right. Uh, or even to make it because the implication right in the show is that it's only wearing Nenya that gives you correct. these visions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the mirror would be, okay, this is perhaps not a turn of phrase Tolkien would love, but would basically <laughs> be a technology by which oh, yeah, she not. can make mm -hmm. that kind of vision accessible to other people, yeah. not just her, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So like I'm going to, she's found a way through, presumably through her own power. Probably a Bluetooth connection. Yeah, from yeah I would imagine, to the mirror. Right? I mean, yeah, oh, oh, could you imagine if like, they have a sinking problem. That'd be oh really embarrassing yeah, to bring yeah. your guests to the mirror. Near field contact, maybe. Be right. Yeah. Than, and they're Bluetooth. like, and it's like, yeah, it's getting really bad reception. Um, but anyway. My uh, earbuds don't work anymore. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> but but seriously, if she um, like basically through her own power, like what yeah. the mirror represents is her ability essentially to share that correct quality. I, of I can see that working. People. That totally makes sense. I mean, if you're wearing the ring and the ring's giving you visions, nobody else can see those visions. Right. right. How do I share this with others? How do I share these views, this wisdom, this information? Right with those who I think will benefit from it. Yeah. Who I have to warn, this may or may not come true. And in fact, this may be very Greek tragedy of you. If right. you try to avoid this, it may in fact happen. Right. Uh, but right. the mirror would be a way to enable her to do that. And that could come about through both, you know, the, the combination of time and wisdom and experience with the ring and its powers. And it would be a really fun thing, actually. Again, you think about the warnings that she gives, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, about what might happen if you turn from your path in order to try to prevent them. Yeah. It would make all kinds of sense to see her learn that the by hard way. experience. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. So. I do think, actually, the, the more we talk about this, the more I do think this is very much a foreshadowing of... Mm -hmm what she's going to do with it later. And, right. and I say that because I think that's something the show is doing in a few other areas. And just for reference, the very final episode when we see Imladris founded, yes. prior to that, yes. we see Elrond, don't destroy all the lore. <laughs> that's the cumulative knowledge <laughs> yes. of all of Elfdom. Yes. I'm going to have to become a librarian, right? Exactly. I mean, it's, it's basically, yes. you know, the the revelation of his yes. drive to exactly. be a war master. Like yes. now we know why he's going to set up the right. hall of fire. And Elrond all that. is and like, Elrond, never again, never again <laughs> shall the, 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 the library <laughs> yes. of Congress be burned to the ground. You know, right. this is not a, right. So I feel right. like the show is sort of setting us up for, mm -hmm. for future yeah. Galadriel and future Elrond. Exactly. Uh, which makes sense because it's one thing with these characters that are new, that have never really been portrayed. Yes. Certainly the, the non-canonical characters, let's say, you know, Arondir. Okay. Yeah. Yep. But even the characters that are canonical, but we've never really seen explored, like Gilgalad or Elendil. Yep. Yes, they're on Peter Jackson's prologue for right. 30 seconds before they're smushed. Right. But, you know, we've never seen them in, on screen. So you can yeah. do whatever you want with them. Yeah. But with characters like Galadriel and Elrond, where we're going to see them later. Yes. You really do need to play into that a little bit yeah. and explain things uh, at least so they're not inconsistent. Yeah, and to and you get the opportunity to show, and this is especially clear, I think, with Galadriel. Yeah, I think we yeah. can. This is not a digression. We intended to do this. We can go ahead. We can go. <laughs> we ahead. did. We actually talked <laughs> about it beforehand. It's totally planned. Um, but thinking about Galadriel a little yeah, bit yeah. more and her whole trajectory, mm -hmm. um, I mean, what is what is clear is that they are intending to show how Galadriel got to be yes. who she is. 100%. And I think that's one of the things that some of the, the viewers who have been very frustrated with Galadriel yes. are, are not thinking about. They're not thinking yes. about the fact that this is, if I can say this, an immature Galadriel. Yes. Yeah, yes. sure, she is already old, but she's yes. not elven old. And right. she is developing as a person. And so we see her making rash decisions. We see her, you know, maybe making choices that the Kate Blanchett version of Galadriel would not make in the Jackson films. Yeah. Because this is thousands of years before. Yeah. And uh, that fits though. It does. I mean, I, I, I think been, about her yeah. rashness in, in leaving mm -hmm. Valinor. Mm -hmm. Sure. She was not really an ally of Feanor. No big, no big fan of no Feanor. Big fan Can of I Feanor. have a hair? Yeah. No uncle, you're creepy. You can't <laughs> exactly. or a cousin. You can't. Right. Uh, but you know, she still, what's the text tells us? That, that her motivation for leaving was to go and set up a kingdom to in find Middle a kingdom to rule I want to go be yeah. boss somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. it was a pretty rash decision to leave Valinor. It's, I mean, it fits. I would go even further than rash. That's shady. It is like, shady. That's, that is like, it's a little narcissistic. Red flag all day long. Yeah. Like, I want to go be a king somewhere yeah. or yeah. queen, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah, no, it's not a good look. And yeah. I mean, and honestly, we can still see, I think that, and, this isn't even a commentary on the Peter Jackson films, no. but rather a commentary on what I think people often take from the Peter Jackson films. And also even from the books as well. There are mm -hmm. lots of people who are like, Galadriel is perfect and Galadriel is awesome. And I'm like, really? Yeah. Have you a read? Ask this Boromir. Ask yeah. Boromir his yeah. views on this subject, right? <laughs> she stripped I, me naked right there and there. Exactly. Ask Sam. As yeah. you said, I mean, Sam reveres her and everything. Yeah. But he's not comfortable with what happened. <laughs> no. Right? I mean, that's what she does with them is, yeah. you know, I think Boromir is not wrong. No. You know, um, if there's anybody whose uh, analysis I question it's Mr. Future Grandson-in-Law, <laughs> who is like, upon her and upon the land of Lorien, there is no stain. And I'm like, whoa, man. Yeah. 
Uh, not I mean, sure. I know you got to speak yeah, highly. Yeah, I know. Like, I think you're over-egging the pudding there a little bit, you know, because <laughs> holy cow. Anyway, no, like she's, she is still tempted. Like, there are still oh, issues. Yeah. Like, there are still issues Until that she, she has. finally overcomes that temptation at the mirror, yeah. with Frodo there, that's when she finally, that's deal. when she becomes yeah. the Galadriel that yeah. we all think about. It's her final step. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so even that, even watching that, you know, and seeing her really be tempted, seeing yeah. her really do again what she does with the company mm-hmm. in that first meeting. Yeah. It's not evil, but it's you know, intrusive. It's intrusive. It's violating. It's, it's questionable. Yeah. It really yeah. is. And so therefore, again, that that it's not hard to predict. It's also backwards. necessary though. I mean, I, I we're criticizing, but I want to be fair that you yeah. know, this is an ends justifies the means sort of thing. For which her. is always a which questionable is also, point. Exactly. exactly. Like it's, yeah. Exactly. Her ends yeah. are fine. Her yeah. ends are good. Yeah. But the means are questionable. And that's a red flag. Yeah. Again, always a red flag. Um, again, the point, I'm not trying to tear down Go no, no. in the book. But the point is there are. She isn't perfect. Right. She's not. There are questions. Like the, the, we, 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 we see her tempted. We see yes. her, uh, you know, possibly. So mm-hmm. it's therefore actually, when you see that stuff, it's easy to imagine. Okay, what was she like? Right, millennia before this. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, especially if we think about, because they're basically, I think, uh, understandably, mm-hmm. they're basically kind of taking her story as if, I mean, it's from the beginning of the Second Age, but it's basically like Middle Earth Galadriel. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, the thing we have to acknowledge is that Tolkien never wrote Valinor Galadriel. Like, no, we don't. I mean, we pre- never see. He her never finished there. retconning her. Correct. Really. Uh, you know, fully through the Aside whole Aside from declining to offer the hair to Fade. Right, there's like, well, that's that the only moment we get. We get. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, and even that was in, what Christopher didn't no. pick that one. Yeah, you're right, that wasn't. Uh, that's but but it's, it's there, was it Morgoth's Ring or something? Anyway, it's it's later. But, um, but yeah, no, so he, even there, even yeah. in the stuff that didn't get included in the Silmarillion, there's not much, No, right? Um, so anyway, the... They seem in the show in some ways to be like, okay, let's take Galadriel from essentially the beginning of her Middle Earth career. Right. Um, and actually, you know, they could have uh, they could have done worse. Like they oh, could yeah. have made her worse. Oh, they could have. I mean, had they represented her as arrogant and power hungry, mm-hmm. that's totally that defensible. That would have worked. Yeah, totally defensible. Worked. And it would have made her look like much worse. Yeah. Like, you know, where we see her at the beginning of season one is rash, angry, mm-hmm. vengeful, and frankly, self-loathing. Like we can yeah. see her own struggles with herself. Yeah. The fact that she, it was her survivor's guilt, you know, yeah. her, her brother's exactly. dead and she's not. And, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the one shot that I always find so evocative, I always come back to this. Um, it was one of my favorite single shots in all of season one mm-hmm. is in that opening scene in the ice palace. Yeah. Um, when she, they, she finds the door, the ice blocking the door. Yes. And she clears it off and she's staring at a reflection of herself and she punches herself right <laughs> yeah. in the face. <laughs> yes. Right. I'm like, that's Galadriel yeah, in season one. That to really me. was, well, you know, that's, uh, and so there's so angry, much impetuous, right. Yeah. And angry at herself yeah, as well as, so. but you know, like mm-hmm. that's, it's no mistake that it's her face that she's punching. <laughs> right. Um, so anyway, that's, that's seeing her beginning to work through those things, yeah. seeing the steps forward that she takes in season two. I think we'll see a lot more at the end of season five. We'll yeah. see Galadriel being a lot more like we know her to be from the third age. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what were your thoughts about, um, where, what they did with Galadriel, um, in episode eight, like in the final confrontation, like where they left her at the end. Um, I, mm, so one of my challenges, uh-huh. and this is true with the text too. Yes. I yes. always have interconsistency of reality. Right. I struggle with the idea th- that her body survived that fall enough to even be healed. That mm-hmm. would have broken, shattered every bone in her body. It's sort of like this notion that she could swim she, back from Valinor. She hit the tree on the way down. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. I know that it's a fantasy. I'm supposed to set that aside, right? I mean, it's it's sort of like it's it's you know me because you you listen to the show, so you know that I'm I'm like, what do your elf eyes see, Legolas? I don't know. I got the curvature of the earth in the way, man. I can't see around. Here. So I, I always you know physics, yep. right? Boromir's yep. horn can be heard from there. Really? Because yep. that means it was the X number of decibels at the site, so all the orcs yes. were imploded yes. from yes. sound pressure. So I, I'm from that perspective, I struggle with it. Like, yeah. all right, we've got massive chest wounds from the crown, 
bleeding out. Forget that they're evil wounds and that you, you can see all this sort of yeah. Morgul blade sort of effects. Yeah. Uh, but then the fall of what had to be 120, 130 feet minimum. I mean, just looking at that shot that we get of Gilgalad and Elrond, it looks like a very fall. cushiony tree. It mm, not cushiony <laughs> enough. So anyway, if I can set yeah. that aside, yeah. yeah, it was an interesting approach to utilize the rings together. But that comes back to a thing in the story on the show that I'm not necessarily a fan of, which seems to be this additive effect mm. of special artifact powers. Mm. Right? I remember when they were talking about, well, Morgoth's crown is powerful, and Nenya is powerful. But neither of them are powerful enough in their own to defeat Sauron. Let's combine them. You got Nenya in my Morgoth's crown. No, you got Morgoth's crown on my Nenya. And then all of a sudden you have enough power to defeat Sauron. It feels like now you've got this, this Gilgalad High King using his ring. Yeah. But it also has to take Elrond to use his ring. See, so... Where's Círdan, by the way? That ring would have helped be heal. I think they might have needed him for yeah, uh, Rondir's wounds, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. He's, 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 he's busy. Yeah, but, he's, um, he is somewhere. Yeah. He's getting the fleet together. Uh, he's got a, he's got a, he's, he's, it was, I think it was an insufficiently dramatic rescue moment. That's fair. For Kierden, he's yeah. got standards, yeah, you that's, know, that's so. fair. I mean, he doesn't even show up for our bed. He just sends a ship. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. No, high standards. Yeah, very high, high standards. He okay. comes into the rescue, but only yeah. under. I did like, struggle with the fall yeah. and the fact that she could even be breathing at that point, because I'm imagining her lungs punctured by 27 broken ribs. I yeah. mean, she's just shattered. I, uh, I hear that. I, I'm I'm so easy. I know I'm you so are. easy. Like I, seriously, and this is true in everything I watch. Yeah. I'm just like uh, I don't know. I've got mad okay, she's alive. Great. disbelief right. skills. I'm just like okay, okay, it's all good. That's fair. That's you know I I yeah, and I I know you know. I did love watching Gilgala try to heal her. Yeah, I, I loved hearing fun. him speak. And, and oh, it was neat. And think, oh, hang on, let me go back to the additive powers thing. Sure. Yeah. Um. So. I just wanted to say, I don't believe the thing about Morgoth's crown. I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't believe that it. That is, at, it was Adar's theory, mm -hmm. uh, right? Yeah. Because, but see, he's starting on the basis. He believed Morgoth's crown would do the trick. Yeah. Right, first time. Yeah, yeah. Right? He, he thought he had done the trick. Right. With Morgoth's crown. Yeah. And so he is looking for, okay, Adar's crown alone didn't work. Clearly not enough power here. Need an upgrade. Yeah. Right. Um, so where can I get a power up? Yeah. Elven rings, right? Yeah. Um, Morgoth's crown plus two. Right. Yeah. That's that's Adar's reasoning, and I don't know that we have any reason to believe that it's true. No, I don't think it is. But even Galadriel thinks it might be true. She thinks it might be. And yeah. what's interesting is because what her what does her ring do? It gives visions and it heals. We also know that from the text that those rings preserve. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that combines into destructive power. I don't either. <laughs> which is one of the reasons why. I, that's why I don't think it could be true. Exactly. That's why I I question it. Yeah. He think now. The, here's the one thing I think from within the show that we reason that we do have to think that that works. I think it's an extension of the preservative power. I'm thinking of the tree, right? Uh, the tree in Linden. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not just that it was healed. You could say it was healed, and it's a healing thing. It was, but the corruption was removed. The corruption was removed, and therefore and if you that could remove Sauron. Is is Sauron. That's yeah. all that was left. Yeah. Right. It's sort of an anti-Sauron. Stab him with a crown. And then what's left is just pure corruption, yeah, right? The spaghetti yeah. monster is, yeah. is the, the the black veins mm -hmm. of corruption, and that's all he is. So if the Splitting rings possibly. do have the yeah. power to do that, then maybe you know, maybe maybe it would work. Um, I mean, the thing I think, uh, I mean, as I've I've said in my earlier analysis, that um, if you want to talk about questionable means and ends situation, mm -hmm. um, whenever you're contemplating using Morgoth's iron crown of world dominion in order to achieve a good end, you might want to rethink yeah. your choices. And you might want to read Mythopoeia. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's, there's a little, yeah. yeah, there's a, it's a, I guess that's what we call a hint that you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> On right? the I wrong mean, track. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I was, uh, I was pretty confident that was not the way, yeah. you know, uh, as soon as that, as soon as that mm -hmm. happened. Um, and in a sense, of course, it makes perfect sense like you would expect that to fail when I yeah. try, you know, um, almost as though they would cancel each other out, by the way. I mean, it, right. it, it, yes, the theory between both Adar and Galadriel is that they would amplify each other somehow and, and right. be able to destroy Sauron in a way. I, it might be the absolute reverse. Right. Yeah. And what I, what I like, um, actually, this is really, I never even thought of this before, but Morgoth's crown stabbing Sauron. If that's and, even Morgoth's crown, by the way. I mean, that's another thing I'm not sure I believe. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sauron actually, says that he melted it down and re, you know, had it refitted to himself. 
Uh, but we know that it was actually that, yeah. turned into the chain that. Actually, I I loved that. <laughs> I loved that moment. Like, even when they're playing with the fact that they don't have the rights to that part yeah, of the text. Yeah, that's exactly when what they were doing. She's like, I thought. He's like, I know what I know. you thought. You've been told many lies. <laughs> You've in been told right, exactly. <laughs> it's like the, you know, it's it's almost like at our cuts are off, being like, whip it, yeah, we don't have the rights to right. say that. <laughs> we don't, you don't say it. It's don't like when Gandalf it. of the Hobbit movies. <laughs> oh, I don't remember the names. <laughs> exactly. Yes. exactly. Those blue guys. Yes. 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 Alatar yeah. and Palando. Oh, no, I'm going to be sued. <laughs> right. yes. Indirect reference to the intellectual property issues <laughs> within the films. But anyway, um, so, yeah, that, that was a funny moment. But actually, I, I always kind of, um, I, I mean, depending on how extreme it is, mm-hmm. I always kind of actually like that. That is, I like when... Uh, when an adaptation calls attention to the fact that the Silmarillion is the elf version of the story. Yes. You know? Yeah, that's um, fair. We, we did this in, uh, in the Return to Moria game. Yeah. Um, we, uh, when they were coming up with the kind of core dwarven mythology mm-hmm. that you kind of discover as you go through the game, mm-hmm. um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that they got to was uh, of... Why? Why did Durin settle in House yeah, of Doom in yeah. the first place? Like he got the sign that he was supposed to be there, so Ale wanted him there. Why? Right. Right. And so we were like, well, the dwarves will have like a mythic answer, like mm-hmm. a, a mythological answer. Of course to this they question. will. Right. Right. Um, and so it involved like the explanation for like the the Misty Mountains mm-hmm. and everything. Okay. Um, and part of the idea was that story about the Misty Mountains being raised. By Morgoth, mm-hmm. elvish lies. They don't know That's what they're right. talking about. The dwarves know why the Misty Mountains are there. The elves are wrong. And here's the real story, according to the dwarves, why the Misty Mountains are there. That fits. Um, so yeah. anyway, like things like that, like that's that that that's yeah. a that's a that's fun Tolkien metatextual stuff. Sure. in my opinion, uh, yeah. you know, it's it's it's. Uh, I can go with that. It's good stuff, but. Um, Anyway, okay, now we're officially digressing, but... Um, <laughs> only now? <laughs> only now. Only I have now. failed. It has taken us this long. <laughs> anyway, back to... No, only now to acknowledge it. Um, back to Galadriel. Yeah. Um, I really liked... Uh, I really liked the telepathy moment between the the Asanwe Kenta moment yes. with the two of them on the cliff. Yeah. When he is um, asserting his like right of entry because she let him in before mm-hmm. right um and yeah there's and the moment of resistance yeah right which anticipates of course shut. that the door yeah. is shut moment uh from the fellowship of the and Brain. that's the thing it was a really really yeah. good textual reference yeah. yeah to her moment when she's explaining to frodo that he yes. ever he tries to probe my mind i see his mind yeah. the door's open that way but right. he doesn't see mine right and uh, i thought that was a really really good yeah sort of Call forward, if you will. To yeah, that text. exactly. No, that was a, that was a really fun moment. I thought I thought that that was handled really, really well. It was funny. Mm-hmm. I saw people, you know, kind of talking about romance stuff again. Uh, so I'm glad you're romance stuff. And I yeah. I have watched that confrontation scene multiple times. I don't see it. There. I don't see it. Not I there. can see it him to her. Oh yeah, but when you say romance him to her. It's more more like the Morgoth Luthien romance. Well, yeah. Right? Well, it's a. Uh, it, I think it's, it's a little des- more personal than that. Maybe, but maybe. still, it's it's uh, desire. It's yes, des- I mean, yeah. and it's just his desire for Galadriel is a fundamentally narcissistic desire. Of course, it is. So you know, it's the possession of the thing he cannot yeah, have. Exactly. Right. It's the exactly. same thing with Morgoth. It's it's the hatred of the light. Yes. You know, uh, the, the desire that he had to 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 go after the sun. Right. 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 I mean, it, every bit of light. Yeah, he craves but cannot have. Yeah, and yeah. I think Sauron, it's the same thing. It's yeah. uh, you know a, a craving, a lust, if you will, even. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily for Galadriel and you know for for her as a woman, but as a figure of light. Yeah. Uh, you know, completely opposite of who he is. Right. But right. definitely no on on her end. I mean, maybe last season we can talk about that at some point. But mm, still, kind of cringe when I think of that. But definitely not in that moment. At that point, she knows who he is. She is done with him. Yes. Uh, as, as can be seen by her toying with the idea of giving him the ring. She's not toying with the idea. She's no, toying with him. with him. Yes. Yeah. And exactly. it was well done. Yeah. Yeah. No, I liked that a lot. Yeah. And then she pulls the Elrond move, which was. Yeah. yeah. Next time, though, if you're going to do that, look for a waterfall first. <laughs> Make it a little easier. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. We find it sufficiently. Yeah. Tree. It's all she good. She just needed to, it needed to be like an Assassin's Creed moment. She needed to find like a, a wagon full of hay to dive into. <laughs> That's yeah. all you need. 
<laughs> and you need a Sorry, big enough wagon for hay. Mixing yeah. my fandoms. I do yeah. that a lot. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, so we've already been alluding to our second question uh, from Stephen, uh, which is about the um, – Callbacks to the books, yeah, callbacks yeah. to the films. Um, it's a it's a big question. It Something is a big question. Come around um, a lot. Yeah. So let's so let's. We've already been talking about book references and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things. What is your feeling when they quote the text? Like half of episode four, which was like episode four, which is like the pastiche of Fellowship of the Ring quotations. Yeah. All the way through, um, with the Tom Bombadil stuff, mm -hmm. and the, and we we got it, we got it all over the place. We did in that episode. We did. I struggled with the Tom stuff because even though it was direct quotes from the text, and I mean really direct, it was really mm -hmm. very well done in that yeah. regard. I just kept struggling because the context of Tom Bombadil was so off to me. It felt like they picked him up lock, stock, and barrel, yep. moved him from the Withy Windle to Rune, yeah. complete with watchdog tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, maybe just get rid of the tree, and I'm not going to feel quite so. Yeah weirded out by this right I, that that felt so bizarre it's see, my experience with it well it's to me it's like a, a model of my experience with so much of the show mm -hmm. and that is yeah i rolled my eyes yeah that wasn't with old man moment. ironwood i'm like come and on. the thing is they could have left on. that out and really? it, it was unnecessary but then as so often is the case when i sat down and thought it through uh-huh i'm like okay actually oh, no. no i think it's brilliant Okay, I still think it's not. So you're gonna yeah. have to convince me. Okay, but Wait, yeah. So so there are the moments where they quote the text. Yes, I'm totally fine with. It. It's an adaptation. Quote the text as, yeah. as much as possible, please. Yeah. Uh, Tolkien wrote beautifully. The dialogue he wrote is wonderful. So please use it as much as you can. But uh, and and I loved it when Jackson did the same. Right. Most of the time. Most of the time. What I the challenge with Jackson though is when he takes the dialogue and he. Gives context it to a, gives yeah, it to a different it to person a at a different time, and it's sometimes like, it oh, works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we sometimes can go to those because there are yeah. a lot of those moments. There are a lot of those. A moment, for example, in the extended editions is when they do give one of Tom's dialogue lines to Treebeard, to Treebeard. Yeah. and that works, right? In that context, it was a little weird. I'm like, oh, they're calling Tom, but you know, okay. Yeah, it was um, a little bit weird. Uh, and other yeah. moments that, like giving Wormtongue the lines to speak to Eowyn Hated about that. the yeah, I didn't like that because yeah. the context is instead Gandalf telling Eomer and be like have some empathy for your sister and what she's yeah. gone through. Yes. And it did sort of take that away, yeah. um, even if the dialogue's brilliant. Here, when they quote the text, as long as the context is right, I'm all for it. My struggle has been, for the most part, with strong dialogue callbacks or visual callbacks to the Jackson films, mm -hmm. only because it breaks that immersion. I mean, okay, think back to, to what Tolkien himself has said about adaptations. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is in On Fairy Stories, and he talks about the... the, the um, uh, instead of a suspension of disbelief, he talks about the inner consistency of reality. Yes. And he says one of the challenges with creating an adaptation, at this point I think he's talking about a stage adaptation, yeah. is he's saying you're essentially creating not a secondary world, you're creating a tertiary world, a third yes. world. Yes. And any violation there, anything that takes you out of that, isn't going to take you back to the secondary world, it's going to take you back to the primary world. Right. Well, here they're almost creating a quaternary world <laughs> because right. they're calling on another adaptation, which is calling on the text, which is not in the right. primary world. So every time you do that, you're, you're breaking that wall in a way that makes it very hard for the viewer to maintain that. Instead, it calls you back to this, frankly, most of the time, better adaptation, dare I say, for the most part. See, and this is the funny thing to me, is that uh, most of the scenes they're calling back to are not the best scenes. No. They haven't done, yeah. <laughs> so that, see, that's that would seem to me just kind of pathetic, yeah. Right? If they were just trying to like milk the scenes that everyone loved most yeah. from the original films, and like let's try to like ride on the coattails of those in this. Scene. I'm waiting for the line where like Gil Galad says something about, you know, there may come a day when, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. And exactly. it might happen, and if exactly. it does, I will cringe then very, very hard. I hear you. Uh, I hear you again. That. <laughs> That would, because, yeah, that yeah. that would seem just kind of a little pathetic. The ones they've done haven't been like that. You know, they, they've not been like follow the your iconic nose. scenes. Follow your nose at the end of season one. That was a cringy moment. I mean, it was also the very obvious for those of you who weren't sure that this is Gandalf. Hello, this is Gandalf. Though they still wouldn't tell us for another season. I, it, the, uh, okay, okay, so, but here's the thing again. I, I don't love them. On the first viewing, but okay. every time I have to rewatch. Every time, but it's not just rewatching. When I do the work that the scene invites me to do, yeah, yeah. right. So if we if we get over, um, 
a lot. I, what I see, uh, like on the internet, what I see mm -hmm. is a lot of people kind of making the assumption, like, well, they're only doing this because they're trying to yeah. like ride on the coach. I have no idea what people. their motivation is, and that's and, the thing. And I like, want to give them some credit. That, for that. is what I would call crit fic, right? Yeah. When what you're doing is instead of looking at what's there in the text, you're theorizing about why yeah. it was put there in the text. And unless right. they tell you this is why we put it there, you don't have any right. sort of authority it, to say this is why they put it there. And the more important thing is that it if you if you do that, it tends to prevent you actually yeah. looking at what's there. Yeah. Right. At what's going on. So when you do it, so when a reference is being made, right, what the what it's asking us to, what that moment is asking mm -hmm. us to do is to take the two things, the moment in the Rings of Power and the moment in the Jackson film, and juxtapose them mm -hmm. and sort of think about the relationship. And when I do that, it's almost always really interesting. So like, for instance, when you think about, um, I, example, Nori and Poppy under the cloak, with the yeah, yeah, yeah. Gaudrim visual coming call in, back to, visual callback to, to Frodo the slope and Sam of that hill in front the, of yeah, the uh, when the Easterling with a mask mm -hmm. comes. I mean, it's very, very close. Oh, it's, yeah, right. the angles, the, the camera angles. Camera, yeah, exactly. A clear, a clear yeah. visual callback. Um, and I agree. It it breaks the immersion in some ways, but it breaks the immersion because well, for me, it makes it breaks the immersion because it makes me think about it. It's like I want to pause there and be like, mm -hmm. hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me process this. Yeah. Right. Let me think about okay, what is what was the context of that scene? Um, what's going on in that scene? What are the dynamics of mm -hmm. that scene in the Lord of the Rings film compared to what we're seeing here? And when I do that, I get I I find it's actually very interesting. Um, you think about the, the 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 moment that that represents when Frodo has just mm -hmm. rashly run off right into yep. what he thinks is the right way, but is actually the wrong way. Uh, and um, and because of it, they're about to be caught, and then you know Sam catches up, and you know so like those are kind of the the dynamics of that, the placement of that moment, in oh, I think it's episode two of the of of the of, of two or three two. I can't remember yeah. yeah it's early early yeah um, is that a similar two, moment yeah. of the choosing of the paths? That's the moment that turns them away from no, let's not go this obvious path. Let's right. instead go that path across the desert yeah. that looks like you know that looks like a really the one really that we're probably going to die if we take this right. Yeah. The juxtaposition parallels like it 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 prompts us to parallel the trip through the desert with the trip to Kirathungal. Mm -hmm. The diversion off the path to yeah. the ultimately more dangerous path, but the one that's going to take them the, the way. one that will actually get them there, right? As opposed exactly. To the one that would, yeah. And so, so it's like, okay, well, that's an interesting piece of work, and that opens up other questions and yeah. you know, can offer some context for other things. As is so often the case with the Rings of Power, you've got to do a lot of work to get there. And that's right. the thing. I mean, I, I, and that's I'm, yeah. I, I find it easier to do that sort of work with cinema than I do with television. I don't know why that is. It's interesting. I, I feel like a movie is a different storytelling tool hmm. than episodic television. So I would have said the same five years ago, but that's been changing for me okay. as as episodic television has been changing. Like that is just, or, or rather, when television was simply episodic. Okay, you're talking about self-contained episodes where yes. you, don't, you don't have a, Compared a continuing to arc. Yeah, one chunk of a long Star Trek arc. versus Babylon Five. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, Babylon Five, I absolutely yeah, consumed. I know. That That's way. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and whereas, exactly as you say, um, especially if you're thinking of something like classic Star Trek, oh, yeah, um, yeah. which barely even tried to do any kind of long form yeah. narrative or character development. Yeah, handful of connections and that's about it, but right, no, exactly. no arc at all. That, yeah, so that kind of classic, like here is another, you know, free floating incident yeah. in the career of this of this spaceship or whatever. Um, yes, in that kind of a TV environment, I don't think about the story in the same way. I'm certainly not gonna be thinking about, okay, what does that moment there in episode two of season two, right? you know, how does that prompt us to look at episode seven, you know, whatever that, but here, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, uh, and, and as I say, I feel like I've been increasingly trained that way by 
this new and to me quite delightful. I love yeah, long form storytelling. I do too. So yeah. I, I, the 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 long episodic narrative uh, television show. I wonder if I will feel that way when all five seasons are out mm-hmm. and I've been able to sit down and watch it as a cinematic experience, as a, as a long story, hour yeah. cinematic experience. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I do yeah. think there's some truth to that. I mean, obviously there there are story arcs that are still in their very early stages. Mm-hmm. We are still on this mm-hmm. upward swing of the arc, you know, yes. and we're not resolving anything yet. Yeah. So you know, six years from now, right? <laughs> when I'm retired and it's all over and I'm watching this show in the, the old folks home. Right. Uh, yeah. It, it'll be, it'll be very interesting. It'll be a different experience for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is it's still, because it takes me out, it sort of makes me cringe a little bit. That was actually not a bad visual callback. That's a good, no. that's an example of a good visual callback. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. now I'm struggling to remember some of the bad ones because off the top of my head, I'm, I'm having a hard time yeah. at the moment. But yeah. for me, a lot of it's the dialogue. And, you know, we mentioned the Tom scene earlier. And for me, one big, absolutely cringy moment. And I know you and I disagree on this. Okay, I'm excited. <laughs> oh, no, he's ready. I'm excited. He is ready. Here we go. Tom. Uh-huh. Misquoting yeah. Gandalf, uh-huh. talking about the importance of you know life mm-hmm. and death and mm-hmm. pity and reversing and it. reversing it. Love it. And of course, now we know later on, after the fact, that he was setting up a false test uh, or setting up a test, but but, but see, with the opposite condition. His misquotation prompted us to see that in advance. That was the, that was the clearest clue that what he that you're supposed to list. I mean. I, if you watch my uh, Rings and Realms episode, you will see I absolutely parsed how that was going to end based on that based quotation. On that. Well, here's the problem. I, I do end up watching your show, but I watch it significantly yeah, later afterwards, yeah. because I have to write my own show <laughs> I and record know, my own know, show. I know, and I don't yeah. want my yeah, ideas exactly. to come from no, yours. I do and the I don't same want thing. Yeah, it's yeah, rough. Exactly. It's like, I want to see what Corey has to say about this, <laughs> but not until I've said what right, I have to exactly, say or I'm going to exactly. sound like I'm parroting you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, in hindsight, with the benefit of seeing that that was, in fact, a false test. Yeah. It's not as bad now. Yeah. But, but see, at the moment, and that's the problem, because you know, we talk about cinematic yeah. versus episodic. Because we are having to consume it episodically, yeah. we don't have that context of the way that ends. Yeah. And it does come across differently. In a film, I'm I am i I'm not I'm, it's still gonna come across poorly, but it's fixed sooner. It, mm-hmm. I don't have to wait a week or two right. or four yeah. for the, that moment to repair itself. The time itself. delay when you're watching it live does make a difference yeah. in that. Which is why watching live. it later when it is out in mm-hmm. all five seasons and I can mm-hmm. watch it over the course of like a week or two yeah. will be a different experience. And yeah, I might find is. that some of the things that I'm most frustrated about now will be less frustrating on that particular rewatch. Yeah, I do. I've often wondered how much of a disservice the weekly drop does as a content show. creator i am so thankful for it i gotta say i yeah. can't even imagine oh, trying please. to write yeah yeah <laughs> oh, yeah no and can no. we please not do three episodes beginning yeah next never time? again please never please just yeah. do one a week it's one, so yeah. much better one one is good thank you one is good yeah yeah do however you think they'll listen to us i'm sure i know there are people out there who think they will because they think we're shills well yeah, I mean, this is us. We just pulled strings. Do you do y'all see that? We totally, that was string pulling <laughs> yeah. in action live. What up, yeah. JD, Patrick? Hey, can you take care of this for us? <laughs> yeah. No, they're not going to do what we, we asked them to yeah. do. <laughs> but but anyway, yeah, so no, 100% agree with that. Yeah. But yes, I do Nor think. Nor should they ask, do what I asked them to <laughs> right. do. They're smarter than me. <laughs> I do think that the um, those kinds of delays. Yeah. Um, because the payoff doesn't happen and you're stewing for a whole two weeks in some cases. Yeah, three or weeks. more. I mean, yeah. it, it, because sometimes the payoff isn't for a lot longer. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that can be really challenging. I mean, like the payoff in, in episode eight, season two, yeah. seeing the Balrog and seeing how they addressed, yes, we found him. And yes, he's locked back up again. Right. Totally fixes something that was a problem that I had in season one. Right. 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 Yeah. And, and, they did it lovely. I mean, to me, that yeah, was that was a great scene. That was an absolutely breathtaking yeah, scene. Yeah, so good. That elevated it to just top-notch yeah. television right there. Yeah. That whole sequence. Loved it. Uh, Loved was it. fantastic. Yeah. No, there was yeah. so much that was really so good in season two. But um, but but yeah. So I, I, but it's, on the whole, I mean, this is what I think. I mean, if anybody asks me what I like what's the thing I struggle with most? What I think is most difficult about the show. It's mm-hmm. simply that it's hard. It's difficult. Yeah. It's hard to get it on a first watch. It's a, it's a show that really, in order to really appreciate it, even in some cases, in order really to get yeah. what's going yeah. on, you've got to watch it twice, three times. I, you know? I watch it at least twice, sometimes three times before we record right. Rings of Power wrap up. And 
that's a big ask for it the is, general public. It's a huge like, ask. I get that. Like, yeah. and I, I, I yeah. Yeah. You know, we were talking about callbacks. I want to come back to that because we just mentioned one without mentioning it. It was the Balrog. The Balrog. The Balrog, yeah. obviously, because John Howe is a conceptual designer on the show. Right. Not surprisingly, exactly. John the Balrog, Balrog looked a lot looks like, like John the Balrog. Balrog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am a, I am firmly in yeah. Camp Balrog wings are metaphorical. And yeah. I thought these were lovely for that. And it the, was it was great. The, the smoke wings were yeah. perfect. And yet you see how subject to gravity he is. Oh yeah, like yeah. He slid Falling down. down. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, Those wings do not work, man. Nope. Nope. And one of the other visual callbacks, I mean, obviously the, the Balrog itself is a visual callback, but the yeah. other one was the whip yes. around King Doran's ankle. Yeah. You know, very much calling back to Gandalf on the bridge. Yeah. That actually worked for me. Yeah. And, and I, I know these are subjective and I know some people are going to say, oh, well, the Tom Bombadil line worked for me, but that whip was too obvious. Right. Uh, okay. We're going to just have to agree to disagree. That's fine. Yeah. But they do make a lot of these callbacks. Yeah. And I'm beginning to wonder whether there's just too many. Like, stand on your own a little bit. Your show is getting better. A lot better. I mean, I'm, I don't know what grade I'm going to give season two yet compared to season one, but I can tell you it's going to be higher than the C minus I gave season one. Maybe a full letter grade higher, and but it, but it could be so much better in a couple other seconds. Just stand on your own two feet and, oh goodness, do I say this here? Do I say this here? Get rid of that entire rune storyline and spend more time wow. in Numenor. Okay, so we don't have, we don't <laughs> have enough done. time for this fight. No, I'm we afraid. don't. Not yet. Uh, I am prepared to defend the Harfoots. No, I, uh, I like them. Don't get me wrong. But um, uh, but anyway, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, here, I was just complaining um, in episode eight that, like, they did too little with the Harfoots. That's my, that's my biggest right. problem. But anyway, whatever. It's fine. Um, <laughs> it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, but... Um, yeah, I think back to the Balrog thing for a second yeah. though. See, um, once again, you take uh, it's not just the whip, but the way the whip yeah. pulls him down and pulls him mm -hmm. to the edge, just like Gandalf, mm -hmm. like the whole body positioning yeah. thing and everything is very everything. closely parallel. Um, so again, it's a very close visual callback. So it's not just a conceptual callback right. to the description in the book, no. right? It's a visual callback to that moment in the film. And what does that prepare you for? Yeah. It prepares you for the fight like, you're in. I, I loved how that worked yeah. because it was like in that moment, you're like King Doran. He's going to sacrifice. Himself. Right. Exactly. He's going to exactly. he's gonna he's gonna sacrifice yep. himself. Yep. You know, and, and I love that he didn't slip off a ledge. Right. I love that instead he jumped off like a dwarf with an ax in his yeah. hand. Ready to yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Fantastic. So that was and, and that's again, that's I feel like that's how their callbacks work. Mm -hmm. The problem for me is that or where I think the problem comes uh, is that sometimes it just takes more effort. Like yeah. That one was kind of easy. Like it, yeah. it was intuitive. Yeah, it was. Um, whereas like the the Norian poppy under yeah. the, like it takes a lot more unpacking to get there. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, so so yeah, where it happens more effortlessly, it works better. Um, I think that's all that's what they're doing. Yeah. I don't, again, I don't mind it. I enjoy thinking about it. That kind of, um, making those kinds of connections and thinking them through is a really fun game. It is. Yeah. But it can make it does make the immediate consumption of the of the show more difficult. That's the thing. It just takes you out for a little bit. Even if it is to think about that other right. storyline. Right. Yeah. And okay. so I guess it just depends on what you're trying to do with the story. Exactly. If you want to keep people embedded, then you don't do that. If you want them to think these bigger thoughts and connect it to the bigger stories, yeah. then go right ahead. Exactly. Yeah. Well, before we can digress any further, <laughs> I should, we should probably we stop. Should. Uh, but, uh, Alan, thanks for joining us. Thank We're going to be around here. Yeah. We're here for our retrospective, doing some, uh, some Q&As and separate discussions here. We'll do the bigger group stuff later. Uh, That'll be good. But awesome. Looking forward to it. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. All right. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.